All right, ready for this? So I heard a broadcaster over the weekend, Kratz, say, who would have guessed that the Pirates and the Tigers would be undefeated right now? Like, How insane is that? Welcome to Overreaction Monday. I don't think that's that crazy. Do you? Tigers, no. Pirates, eh. The Marlins are missing their entire rotation. And the Pirates barely beat them in most of those games, oh. discounting them. But are you shocked, AJ, that the Pirates and the Tigers are undefeated right now? Uh, no, because the White Sox suck, and <laughs> I mean the Marlins didn't do anything this offseason. So no, I'm not. I'm not that surprised. I'm more surprised probably the Yankees are undefeated than anybody. Yeah, I mean, no one thought they were going to go into Houston and win four. So I think that's a bigger shock than the other two. I mean, the Marlins, uh, whatever their you know their best starters are hurt. They really didn't do anything to address anything this offseason. And then the White Sox aren't any good. So, I mean, the Tigers are trying to compete. So it's completely different different things. But, I mean, I, I said last week when I went to the Pirates last week ago, the Pirates have something brewing. They believe in it. And our guy we had on, Jared Jones, he looked nasty. Yeah. What do you have, 10Ks and five and change, something like that? Yeah. Five plus 10Ks, that'll do. Ooh. By the way, close games I mentioned, Pirates, Marlins, and – Tigers, White Sox, at least the first, what, two of those, were they all one-run games? Those were close games. Uh, first game was one nothing. I don't second know what the game, second game. Second game, second game we were up 6-3, and they won 7-6. The yeah. Tigers did, and then the third game yesterday, obviously 3-2. to two, But, yeah. So, I mean, but bullpen woes for the White Sox. I mean, surprisingly, bad teams don't have great bullpens. Yeah. You know, they don't really hit that great. I mean, they cleaned up the defense, so they didn't make that many errors. So, I mean, I guess it's good. But, you know, that's what Chris Getz said when he was on here was that, you know, he wanted to clean up the defense, which they did. But still got to score runs. It's going to be a great race to the bottom. Days are ahead of them. So are the Rockies. Yeah, they won. They won games. It's going to be good to follow. Before we dive into Charge the Mound real quick, I was your brief stint in San Diego. You see a lot of talent. Yeah. Um, Cease was disappointing for me. I mean, you know, that he didn't throw a lot of fastballs. He was behind in the count too much. Um, you know, it was, it was kind of typical Dylan Cease when he struggles. Um, but listen, I'll say this. The Giants look good. Uh, Jung Hu Lee going to be a player. Conforto looked like he's kind of back to where he was before he got hurt. Um, I mean, this is one game, obviously. And then the Padres went out and crushed him yesterday. So, um the Padres have holes, I believe, and both teams have holes. The problem is both teams have to get the ball to their ninth inning guy. So who's going to be able to bridge that grab better is going to determine who's better out of those two teams. Um, you know, starters, you know, when they get Webb, Snell, obviously Ray, Harrison pitched good. Um, the game I did. Uh, Hicks was good. Hicks pitched great. Yeah. Um, he looked like a starter. So, I mean, I, th- I think the Giants right now are a more complete team, but there are some major holes in – especially the Padres. I mean, one through four, five, I guess five. Then you get to Profar, who's a, a serviceable big leaguer. But, you know, you kind of get down for that. And, of course, you know, Capisano is going to be a good player for him. He didn't play the game I did. But it's going to be interesting to see how both these teams are managed. But both teams have holes. It's just going to be a matter of who can fill them better. Mm-hmm. Did you Joey talk Bart, to anybody? Oh, did you talk ahead. to anybody with the Giants about Snell? Is there anything new as far as, like, timeline He's and all that stuff? supposed to pitch Wednesday, I think. He and pitched the official? day before. He pitched Friday, uh, four innings against Double A somebody, and punched out like eleven, I think, in four innings, something crazy. Um, he was in the dugout. He got to the dugout right at game time, and they showed him, and they did a whole like thing. They did like a thank you, Blake Snell. Um, but uh, I thought they said he's going to pitch against the Giant. I mean, against the Dodgers, and I think they said Wednesday. I was pretty sure they said Wednesday. That's pretty quick. Then you don't miss that much. No, I mean, we just do four innings, come back, he gives them five against the Dodgers. I mean, they're, you know, then you'd start ramping it up. But, I mean, yeah, he didn't miss that much. Yeah. And Joey Bark got DFA'd, by the way. We're not going to have time for that. So I just wanted to sneak that in there. 2018, number two overall pick. I'm going to move on. Just didn't work out. Offense, defense, the whole deal. Let's charge the damn mound. He's charging the mound. I know he's on the Brewers now, but. Our Philly area specialist, Eric Kratz, is on the scene for the Reese Hoskins against the World of Mets discussion. Or is it the World of Mets? So Jeff McNeil gets spiked a little bit on the slide. 
not happy about it. Team comes to his defense eventually, and Reese Hoskins makes them pay later on. He gets hit by a pitch, or not, sorry. He gets, uh, he watches a pitch go eight feet behind him. Um, that player, Jan Ramirez, is suspended, so is Carlos Mendoza, and here we go. Mendy, Mendy, we asked him when he was on here, are you going to get thrown out before Booney gets thrown out? Well, technically, I guess he didn't get thrown out, but he's missed a game already, so he's he's hot on the trail. I, I feel like it's a... I don't know. I feel like McNeil kind of overreacted here. I feel like, yes, you know, I understand he doesn't want to get cleated in the top of his cleat, like, and he doesn't think he should slide through the bag like that. But I don't, I don't see anything wrong with it. And then the whole, like, I mean, he was pissed right out of the gate. Like there was no, like, he's the dirtiest player. They have video of him being, this player all the time. I think Reese handled it well. I don't think Reese was like, oh, hold me back, hold me back. He's like, what are you even talking about? So I, I don't know. I feel like this was blown out of proportion by McNeil. I don't see anybody else getting pissed, that's for sure. I, I think Hoskins didn't do anything wrong. I think the, the rule is the rule. He went right into the base. He went a little past the base. Whatever McNeil was looking like he was going to throw the ball. I mean, right there, look, he's trying to throw the ball and he loses it on a transfer. So if you're Reese, what are you supposed to do? You got spikes, so what? It's big leagues. I mean, I'm tired of us like, oh, no, no nobody touch anybody. And, and McNeil, listen, I mean, they were, they were getting their butts kicked again. And the biggest problem I have with this is the way the Mets handled it. You let him go three for three with four RBIs and a dinger and you throw one at his head? Like, that's piss poor for me because you just don't do it like that. You got a problem with what he did the day before? Throw at him the next at bat. Listen, I had this happen to me. When I was with the White Sox, I did kind of the same thing. Back when you could actually take a guy out, Ben Zobras went all whiny baby too and like this. And, and then the next game, we played, we finished the game. They didn't throw at me. The next day I played, they didn't throw at me. Then they waited a whole other day and they threw at me like my third at bat the next day, whatever. I'm like, and then, you know, and then we threw back at them because Robin Ventura was pissed that they threw at me two days later. And, and that was the famous Hawk Harrelson, Wegner, what are you doing? Well, you know, you are crazy, whatever, because I think Jose Quintana threw behind somebody and, and, you know, the Rays got all up in arms. But I'm like, you know, if you're going to do it, just do it the next at bat. Like, why wait? There's no reason to wait. If you're pissed at a guy, drill him. All right, boom, we're finished. Dawson's been like, okay, we're done. But, I mean, McNeil getting in his face. I mean, plus, you know what? The Mets were getting their butts kicked, so they were just frustrated. You know what? Don't get your butts kicked. I asked a player once why sometimes they wait, and I got two answers. One was game situation, and two was I want it to be in his head for a little bit, which I think is a bitch move. Dude, just get it over with. I mean, I, I don't, I don't just get it over with. Wait, what, why wait? What you think I was sitting around going, Oh, when are they going to hit me? I'm like, okay, it's over with. Great. Moved on. And my next to back came by. I'm like, okay, race is the same way. He's like, all right, I'm three for three with a dinger and four RBIs. I mean, it doesn't get, come on. It doesn't get in your head. The, the, the game is not a game of intimidation. The game is a man's game that is played hard. So you're not sitting there going, oh, is he going to hit me? Is, is he going to, you could, you could play that game in your head all the time. Like to me, you go exactly what AJ said. You go, you get, you take care of business. To me, though, if if I'm sitting on the Mets, I'm like, we don't we don't need to throw at him. I, I don't feel like he really did anything. Unless Jeff is like super pissed about it and he comes in, why is nobody protecting our players? Then, hey, you know what? Then I'm all for it. What, whatever it is, you got to own up to it. You can't be like, oh, it slipped or, oh, we did it too late or we did own up to it. It is what it is. Uh, I mean, these quotes are great. McNeil's mad because he got <laughs> spiked. Get out of the way. I mean, imagine if he was McNeil was playing back in like the 1970s when Hal McCray used to tackle dudes. I mean, remember what was it? Victorino tackled the guy that one time in, oh. in Milwaukee, right? I mean, but Reese's was quote. Reese, I mean, what Reese did. Now they have a celebration. Now the Brewers have a celebration, so they can thank Jeff McNeil because they're all going doing the crybaby thing. So they have a great. Now they have a great celebration. <laughs> Right out of the gate. Right out of the gate. You're right. And they handed it to him, too. It's a good call. The Brewers' starting rotation had a sub two and a half ERA, starting with Freddie P, friend of the show. Uh, Adam Jones, by the way, with the tweet, we showed it, but I'll read it for the podcast. As someone who thrived on these situations because I want extra outs for my team, this is clean. I would have folded his ass to left field. Infielders got to get out of the way. We can break them up, not dirty. 
but they don't they don't have to anymore because the new rules they take like catchers so we we can't run over the catcher because one guy got hurt i mean there was plenty of guys that got hurt over the course of years and then oh oh, no one guy buster posey because he was the face of baseball gets hurt and he complains and they change rules like i mean i thought that was awful i used to love those plays and then chase utley i mean listen what chase utley did was it was bad he broke the guy's leg i get it but in the heat of the listen as a base runner you are told, I am go get that guy. Do not let that guy turn a double play. So you, I mean, there was times I, when I listen. I hate to go like you know when I played, but listen, when I first came up, the dudes got out of the way. Like if you got if I got hit by a pitch, and I was pissed, guess who I go after? That guy at second base, and I look at him and be like, guys would be like, I'm coming for you. And guys knew they were like jump, get out. They like they knew how to throw and jump and all the accurate now. Uh-huh. You see Ozzie Smith jumping like three feet in the air over guys sliding. They don't do – they just catch it because they're not expecting it. So, it's just a different era. and I don't know. Whatever. I mean, the rules are the rules, and I, I don't know. It's not a contact sport. Well, Rob Manfred and his rules committee has made that very clear. <laughs> there you go. What about the Rays and the Jays? A little benches clearing action. And Jose Caballero – Pulls off a nice little bunt that leads to a run. He actually gets out, gets uh, tagged out at third by a mile, um, but he pissed off Genesis Cabrera. I don't have a problem with what he did either. I don't know why Cabrera got so mad. I mean, he was out. He kind of lost his balance, and he just kind of, you know, I don't know, ran into him a little bit. I don't know, and then Cabrera got real. Now, listen, I don't know if there was history there. I don't know if they – because he – because he did say, Caviar did say something. I don't know what he said, but then Cabrera immediately shoved him. So I don't know what was said there. So, I mean, again, unless you know what was said, it's hard to – like right here, okay, you know, Cabrera's real close right there. He Like, and then blah, 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 and then, you know, Cabrera literally right away. So I don't know. There was no history. They asked him afterward. That it well, everyone like says there's no – You're saying he's lying. Like, no, I'm not saying anyone – I'm not calling anybody a liar. I'm just saying, of course, they're not going to say, yeah, we had an issue back somewhere. He stole my girlfriend. Yeah. Uh, wait, I have one question here, right here. Can't Caballero move though? If you want to really diffuse yes. the situation, he, he, yes. his lips are an inch away from Cabrera. So I actually haven't heard this much, but I'm looking at it at the time and I'm like, I get it. Cabrera shouldn't have shoved you, but you're this close. You're asking for, you know, like when someone's like going up to someone and they put their fucking face in someone else's face, like, are you trying to get punched? Cause if you don't want to be in a situation, that's when you would walk away. Which is what Reese Hoskins did in a much steamier situation. Hundred percent, Caballero. He he brought that on himself. I, I I think he's lucky he only pushed him. Like to me, you might that dude might throw a punch. Cabrera might throw a punch right there. He got closer to him. Yeah, he might not have liked it because he was not ex- like the pitcher was still standing in the way after he kind of ran through the base. Maybe he's expecting Caballero to to slide and not run through the base in that situation. But like he stepped back in his face. You got to push somebody out of the way if they're, if they're getting in your face like that, like that to me, that, that whole situation's on Caballero. And that's actually a take I haven't seen very often. Most of the takes are just like, Oh, you know, Cabrera shouldn't be shoving them. Come on. Cabrera. Why, why was he so close to the base is my first question. And second of all, like, I know Caballero bumped him, but like, yeah, Caballero could have walked away. But again, we don't know what was said. We don't know. Yeah. So, I mean, there, we, we just don't know. So, I mean, to put it on one guy or the other is is tough. You know, like the Hoskins things, I understand why Neil's mad. I understand why Hoskins is mad. This one is like, we don't know what was said. We don't know who said what. So, it's kind of like, all right, well, they, it's, you know, it's boys being boys. Like, nobody threw a punch. Nothing really happened. I mean, listen, it's great for baseball. We're, we're four games in. For a lot of these teams, we've had like four fights already. I mean, four shoving matches. I shouldn't call them fights, but four bench clearing brawls or whatever it is, or bench clears. And it's, listen, it's exciting. And people, it shows you care. And people like to see this stuff. Cabrera was pissed that he bunted. Maybe. Or just frustrated at the play. My only thing is, if you're going to put your face right in someone else's face and then go, mm-hmm. oh, 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 that's an instigator for me. See it in basketball all the time too, you know. Go in someone's face, and then someone shoves them away, and they're like, "Oh!" And then they flop. It's like enough. Uh, Overreaction Monday continues with the zero and two team meeting for the Angels with Ron Washington after that second game. 
Orioles are really good at ball. What would your reaction have been if you're 0-2 and you're on a team that you know is not going to be good this year and your manager calls for a team meeting after two games? We don't know what was said. Maybe he said, hey, guys, we're doing the right stuff. Let's just keep doing what we're doing. Or maybe something happened. I, we don't know. But they won the next game, so it was good. Yeah, true. You just don't know what was said. Maybe he just said, hey, guys, we've lost the first two games. Forget about it move on. I mean, how long was the team meeting? Five seconds? Ten seconds? A minute? Ten minutes? Like, who knows? See, that's what he said. No one wanted to get into the specific was said. It sounded as like the tenor was not letting things spiral, right? Okay. So basically, maybe Ron Washington said, all right, guys, it's only two games. Let's move on. So the overreaction is actually people saying, why are you calling a team meeting? For me, it is. Yeah. I mean, who knows? Maybe know. maybe he had to make an announcement about a bus time or something. Nobody <laughs> knows what it was said. That's no one. I mean, you just don't know. Like, why? Plus, Ron Washington was great team meeting, so I was all four team meetings with Wash. He was yeah. awesome. There's a few MFers said in those team meetings. I'm just – I've never been in a Ron Washington team meeting, but I'm going to say there was a couple – if, if he's pumping the boys up, even if he's not pumping the boys up, it might just be there's some good MF and eggs and bacon for sure. I mean, the team's not going to be great. I think that's – But I think it's that more That doesn't about, mean anything. Yeah. yeah. It's more about – he's also trying to build it for not only this year, but maybe next year, right? So he's – what did he sign? A two-year deal or whatever it was as the manager? Yeah. So he's also looking ahead, and he doesn't want – he doesn't want people to be like, oh, we're 0-2. Like, let's give up. Like, no. Like, he's probably like, hey, just stay the course. Guys, let's just stay the course. It's only two games. I mean, what do you think Joe Espada's doing? They're 0-4, and, and they were supposed to be really good, and they got their butts kicked by the Juan Soto and the Yankees, right? I mean, maybe – why didn't he hold a team meeting? You know, stay the course. They've been through it, right? The Angels, Ron Washington's like, new sheriff in town. I know it's only two games, guys, but let's keep focusing on what we're doing. And they went out one Sunday, so it was a good meeting. Also, you're There's in Baltimore. I mean, that might be the best team in baseball. Yeah, but the whole, the, I, you know, the whole thing about you saying they're not going to be good. You don't sit there. You're not in that clubhouse going, we're not going to be good. Maybe there are some guys who are sitting there going, oh, yeah, can't believe we're, you know, this. And so a team meeting is not like a team meeting like AJ was saying. Play, teams who lose have team meetings. Teams who win don't have team meetings. This is to me. This is what I've heard. Ron Washington is about, and he's about always keeping the boys in line, not in a not in a militaristic sense, but in a positive. Continue to do what we have here, and they came away with a, a victory in Baltimore. Like you said, one of the best teams in baseball, if not the best in the American League. Mm -hmm. um, we're going to talk to Max Monty in a sec, so. Did you have fun watching that series, Kratz? Oh, man. I mean, is that everything that we want out of a series? Like, the the Dodgers just keep coming back. And, like, the, the final game was, to me, the final game was, was awesome. And I guess I'm kind of jaded because I just think they're going to continue to come back. But I can't wait to ask Max, and he can probably already hear us. That home run – to me, says to to Doc, hey, next time a lefty's in, why don't we just put this game away and keep me in the lineup all nine innings instead of bringing me in, pinch hit, oh, I delivered, big deal. Then I hit a dinger off the lefties. You guys think I can't hit. He was like, that was, to me, that is where this team could take it to the next level if they don't get lost in their platoons because they have elite dudes up and down their lineup and it's a suffocating lineup especially when Kike hops in I think Miggy Rowe hit a dinger in the second or third game I'm forgetting like this this team is this team is that good Yamamoto's good too yeah, yeah he's not gonna yeah. Yeah. but I mean I don't know that anybody went into this year saying the Cardinals have an offensive juggernaut either true Right. So, I mean, I mean, he overreacted after his first start. A lot of people did. Now, let's not, it's probably going to be somewhere in between. Okay. I mean, he threw well, but let's yeah. not. One bad, one good. We'll see what's next. Let's bring in our first guest of the day on Monday, Max Muncy, man of Sunday Night Baseball, joining us right now. Max, what's up, man? How was that uh, night for you? Yeah, it was, uh, it was fun. Uh, you know, obviously, I enjoyed it. It was a good win good for the boys we got to celebrate it so it was good 
bat flip. I mean, were you have that planned or what? Because that was an epic bat flip you had. I mean, that just natural, or you've been like holding that one back for that big moment when all of a sudden, woo! No, that one just that one just happened. I don't ever plan that kind of stuff. That one just happened. Felt like a good moment for it. Uh, you know, it's kind of a big moment for us off the lefty late in the game. Got us the lead. It's a good one. But you you can't hit lefties. I thought that's what I was gonna say. No, I can hit lefties. We just have some yeah. guys that hit lefties better than I do. Oh, uh, okay. Do you believe oh. that? Do you believe yeah. that? Because I think if you get – that's what I felt like, and I'm putting words in your mouth. That's what I felt like the bat flip was. It felt like it was like, yeah, I could do this all the time. I, to me, your at-bats against lefties are really, really good. If you go back – if I go back and watch them, to me, I don't think you're dominated by lefties. Look, the the bullpen lefty is a tough one, right? But that's why they're there. That's the whole reason they're on the team is to get lefties out out of the bullpen. Those guys are nasty, especially now. You know, JoJo Romero for them, whipping a 98-mile-an-hour sinker in there and then a sweepy slider, it's just not really a fun at bat. I mean, the other night he struck out me, Shohei, and Freddie. And, you know, those other two guys, those are really good lefties also. And they he still struck them out like it was nothing. So the bullpen lefty is always a tough one. The starter lefty to me, I always felt like I've had really good at bats off starter lefties. It's just, you know, last couple of years, I've, I've, my swing hasn't been right, you know, I had the injuries. And um, so the numbers get skewed there a little bit, but before then I felt like I hit pretty well off lefties, you know, off the starters all the time. We hit lefties, I'm sure in the minor leagues, right? You had to hit lefties to get to the big leagues. I never understood that. I, I hit left-handed and I'd go, I was fine against lefties in the minor leagues, and you get to the big leagues, and they're like, "Oh, uh, we're gonna put, we're gonna have a, the righty guy hit for you." I'm like, "But I always hit lefties just fine, and now all of a sudden I can't hit." Like, wait, what changed? Just because I went up a level? Yeah, you know, I, I, I don't know, I don't know about that. I think, uh, <clears throat> yeah, there is a lot of noise on that, but you know, for me, it's a, uh, it's not that I can't hit the lefty. Um, you know, I have good at bats off lefties. They know I have good at bats off lefties, uh, but we do have some other guys that the whole reason they're there is to hit lefties and. Um, you know, that's just how the team is. And that's, uh, that's how the team was designed and built. And that's one of those things where you got to buy into it. And if you're, if you're there questioning it, then it's going to make things a little bit, a little bit difficult for guys, but I'm all in on it. And, you know, I'm not, I'm not sitting against every lefty, but you know, we have to get those guys at bats. And this is, it was a, yesterday was a good day for me to have part of it off, I guess it was supposed to be a full off day, but, um, you know, if there's ever a chance to win the game, you're obviously not going to complain about that. No, you mean you weren't going to be like, no, Dave, I don't want this at bat. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> yeah there's 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 no one on the team that does that you know we, we all buy into it we're all there to win and uh it, you know that's what makes it fun hey as a third baseman when you're watching i have to ask you this question because it happened twice and i don't know i mean maybe it happened to me once in my career catcher's interference are you going to tell barnes and will smith to back up a little bit because i mean goldschmidt well, you know not what's barnes funny arm is what's funny is that you know we have our, our our pre-series meeting for before we play every team right and and Bob Guerin, who loves doing this stuff, gathers all the information, the random information that no one else even thinks about. He he actually collects how many times uh, a batter has gotten catcher's interference over the last two years. And so he'll tell the catchers that. And the two guys that had it, they were on the report. And, uh, you know, I guess I guess it just we forgot or we weren't listening or the swing was longer than what they thought. Um, not entirely sure. But those were the two guys that were on our reports that have uh, a lot of catcher's interference. So what you're saying is Will Smith wasn't listening because he was spending his new extension money since he got 10 years? I mean, how come he that got 10 not, you only got two? That is not what I was saying. That is not no. what I was saying. <laughs> <laughs> no, but he got 10, you got two. I mean, do you go back and say, hey, Andrew, uh, you know, I, you know, know some of that. You know, I'll take a couple more years. You know, we'll, 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 we'll see what happens on that one. <laughs> <laughs> were you, all right, well, obviously you were happy for Will, right? Like, that's pretty oh, cool. 10-year deal for a catcher? Yeah, it was incredible, especially for Will. Such a such a good dude, such a good teammate. Guy works so hard, and uh, to see him get rewarded for it, and especially in a place that he wants to be, uh, you're always rooting for for stuff like that to happen. And so when when the news comes out, you're obviously ecstatic about it. And you know, me and my wife, we were super happy for for their family. We reached out to them and um, you know, just relayed how how pumped we were. We were uh, uh, tough to contain our excitement for them. <laughs> Do you guys have a celebration in the clubhouse for dudes like that? Do you mention it or is it just kind of like, ah, you go up and say, congrats. Do you have like, hey, we all bought this and you're going to pay for it? Kind of like breaking in his new contract? Yeah, he gets to pay for dinner, you know. Okay, with with you and your wife, is that what it is? Or is it just the rest of the rest of life? No, the whole 
the whole, the whole team. He gets to pay for dinner for the whole team. You know, it's all right. And what is and what does Shohei say? Should have deferred it. <laughs> <laughs> Don't worry, Shohei's got to pay for dinner also. Uh, okay. You know, we we all we all take our turn. Um, Will Will's already picked out his spot, so he's 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 ready for it. You guys say to Will, congratulations! You're the twentieth highest paid player <laughs> now on this team. <laughs> <laughs> kind of feels like that, but no, I think he's I think he's doing just fine. I don't I don't think he's too upset about that. <laughs> yeah. Did did you buy dinner in Seoul? Because we haven't talked to you since you went over to Korea. Did you did you buy anything in Seoul that we should know about? No, no. I was uh I was pretty low key. I was you know the like the week before we left, I got uh, uh was it nor- norovirus norovirus. So I got extremely sick. I I dropped about twelve pounds just throwing up and in the bathroom every thirty minutes. Uh, so when we got over there, I was really kind of, kind of just focused on uh, trying to get get some of my strength back so you didn't eat any of the weird stuff then you you had an excuse you had the cousin of the coronavirus the norovirus yeah i i didn't i didn't venture out into uh you know some of the 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 street food that was out there but the the food that they did have for us was actually pretty good it just uh it didn't entirely sound enticing to me just because i was sick but uh, the stuff that i did have was really good um how about another rich dude on your team Yamamoto going from a shaky first start to the one that we just saw this weekend looking much sharper so what did you observe from him in that first start like simply nerves you know a little nervous in your first start he's gonna be fine he's gonna be really good you don't I I know it's a different league but you don't do what he did in in Japan and come over here and you're suddenly just not a good pitcher anymore um you know we, we all know he's gonna be fine he just it, it could have been nerves. It could have been, uh, you know, it could have been any number of things. But, uh, you know, I think what we saw the other day is really more what we're expecting out of him. And I think what he's expecting out of himself. And um, but he's not going to punch out the world. Right. He's going to have his strikeouts. But it, it's it's you know, it is a different league and um, there might be a couple ups and downs for him. But, you know, he's going to be just fine and he's going to be really good. OK. Um, how about Teoscar Hernandez blending in with the team right now off to a hot start? For someone like him, he's been asked at times to, I don't want to say carry a team, but look at him last year. I mean, he's on Seattle. They're expecting him to hit 40. It's a tough ballpark to hit in. He even said, like, it was not his park. He wasn't seeing the ball well. Now he gets to join a team and be like, sure, I'll just kind of, you know, squeeze my way towards the bottom of this lineup, hang out, and just bop homers. Yeah, it's a good spot for him, you know. It's uh, – it. It, that's that's one of the huge things with our with our lineup is it allows guys to just be themselves and not have to try to do too much, not try to be someone that they're not, and uh, not put too much pressure on themselves. And so for him, it's a chance to just relax. And he's going to have plenty of opportunities to drive in runs. He's going to have plenty of opportunities off lefties. It's uh, you know the the chances are all going to be there. And he's just so far he's been doing a good job of it, just kind of relaxed. And um, you know there's not too much tension and pressure on him. And um, you know we got we got three other guys that are taking a lot a lot of that attention and. Yeah, for the most of us, it's it's a good thing. It just kind of helps us relax and uh, allows us to go out there and play the game. I tell you who's grabbing all the attention right now is your leadoff hitter. What did he eat in Korea? And then were you all like, I want some of whatever you've had? Because then he just carried it right over to L.A. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. He's uh, he, he's off to one, to one heck of a start. Huh? It's, uh, it, it's, you know, to me, it's almost this, this shortstop thing is making him just focus so much more on other things because he's working so hard to be to be ready for shortstop that he is just so locked in on everything that he's doing and that i'm not saying that he wasn't before because the, the dude cares about hitting it and you know he's his work is meticulous on that but it's just a whole nother level right now and i feel like it's because he's so prepared trying to to get himself ready for shortstop that he's just it, it's carrying over to his offense and you've really seen it right now it's incredible to watch he's on he's on some kind of run right now and it's a uh, um you know it's that's that's what Mookie does. He, you know, he just kind of takes over, and um, you know, it's really not it's not too too surprising at all. I mean, you're on the left side with him. Do you guys do you guys have a thing? Is he like is he telling you anything during the game? Do you guys joke around, or is he like super locked in because it's kind of a new position for him? No, he's he's pretty he's pretty light out there. You know, he's you, you can definitely tell he's he feels comfortable right now. Um, he's not. He, he's me and him are working hard on our communication and our, you know, be, before the game, we're doing a lot of drills. We're trying to work on communication, letting each other know where we're at and, um, you know, just just work on a couple of things. And 
it's been going really well and we get in the game and it allows him to relax because we're, we're understanding where, where each other's at and uh, we're able to, you know, crack a few jokes here and there and just laugh. And it's, 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 it's been a good time so far. And, you know, I, I really feel like he's going to, he's going to turn out to be a really good shortstop. Is the reason you guys can't speak very much during the game is because your pitch com was turned up too loud. Like Kike's was last night. Did you see that? Can't you? Well, you know, what's, what, what's funny is I can guarantee you it didn't sound that clear in his ear. Um, <laughs> well, you know, it was well, clear as day on TV. Literally, they were like, change up. I, well, so I, I got his pitch com when I came in the game. They, they put his exact pitch com in my hat, and it was on the same volume. And when you put those things in your hat, it sounds muffled in your ear, and then you got the crowd noise. So I was actually shocked that it sounded that clear on the broadcast because, like I said, I can almost promise you it was not sounding that clear in his ear. <laughs> The those things are kind of these things are kind of hard the, to hear in the middle of the game. Yeah, you, you almost have to put yeah. your your glove up to your hat and press it down. You know, they they get pretty hard to hear. So I it, hearing it that clear on the on the the broadcast was pretty wild. Does he go to Kangaroo Court for that? Like, how does that work? I mean, those those mics pick up everything clearly, but you have to rethink yeah. Well, that you know, the the good thing with that is you know in, in the cage they have the 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 TVs going with the broadcast up. The ESPN broadcast yesterday was about eight pitches behind the the live events. Um, you know, usually it's about a thirty second to a minute delay. the The one yesterday was like you know almost five minutes behind. It was it was a big delay. So that is the good news is that if ESPN's doing it, um, it's definitely not in real time. So you can't be relaying anything. <laughs> Tell me about Bobby Miller's outing. Tell me what this guy. Something that we don't know about Bobby Miller that we should know besides the fact that he's nasty and he seems like, to me, he seems like he, no matter what's going on, good or bad out there, he seems like a vet and he's like seven years old. Yeah. You know, he's kind of a, he's kind of a killer out there. He's a, uh, you know, just the, the attitude, he, he doesn't really care who you are. And you've, we've already seen that a couple of times where, uh, you know, he's, he stared at a couple guys and they stared him back and he doesn't back down at all. And, um, you know, that's kind of the attitude he brings. And I, I said it last year, he reminds me a lot of Walker in the, in the terms that neither of those guys care who you are. They're coming at you at the plate. They feel like their stuff's better than whatever you can bring at the plate. And, um, you know, that's, that's how they pitch and it helps them pitch. And it's what makes them good. And on top of having really good stuff too, you know, it's, it, he's got four really good pitches and he commands all four of them. And, um, you know, it's, he's, he's going to be a special pitcher. And, uh, you know, I just think, he, he likes to work hard. He likes to pay attention to the game. He likes to listen to to the older guys talk about how they approach certain hitters. And he he really actually listens to that. And he, he, uh, he implies it into his own game. And then he goes out there and he executes his game plan. And he's not just – he's not the, just a guy that's saying, I'm just going to blow a fastball by you, even though he does have that attitude. He's out there, you know, focusing on what pitch he knows can get you out. And he's trying to throw that pitch. So he's learning to pitch with his 98 to 100. That's scary to me, but that's <laughs> another another reason I'm glad I don't I don't hit at a completely below average level. Did you see the yeah, you know, that's, that's, that's that's the game today. Everyone's everyone's throwing that with command with movement. That's just the game today. Uh, it's boring. It's boring for you. It's boring for you. That's why that's why you're gonna hit 40 homers. The game's easy. No, uh, it's, it's 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 anything but easy. I would never use the word easy. <laughs> Did you see the Hoskins slide? In in New York, with McNeil. Uh, yes, and McNeil. I do. So you've moved from second to third to first, to you know all around the infield. What's your what's your opinion on the slide, the reaction by both of the guys? Because that's really what we're sitting here talking about. Or how would you feel about it if you were Hoskins rolling in, or if you were McNeil at second? Uh, look, the slide was what it was, right? Um. Whether it was dirty or clean, that's for anyone else to decide. But the slide was what it was. He 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 clipped him. He went off to the side. He went through the bag. Whatever, right? Um, the reaction was interesting to me. Um, I feel like if you're going to go through that much animation to have that kind of reaction, you might as well just pop him while you're right there. Um, instead of letting the benches clear and then this turns into a big ordeal, um, you might as well just get it over with right there. Uh, or you just say a quick word, let it be done and know that his next at bat, there's probably going to be one coming at him. Um, and I think Hoskins knew that just kind of watching the games unfold when the ball went behind Hoskins, there wasn't too much of an overreaction from him. So to me, that told me, Hey, he kind of knew it was coming and he did the, he did 
what guys that know it's coming usually do. He looked at the pitcher and said, hey, if you're going to hit me, hit me in the ribs. Don't throw at my head. Um, there was nothing about, hey, why are you throwing at me? It was, hey, if you're going to do it, put, put it in the ribs, not in the head. Uh, so that to me told me that he probably knew it was coming. Um, and, you know, to me, again, that's one of those things where, hey, just say your piece and move on. And the guy that made the slide knows there's probably one coming at him. You hit him and then it's over and done with and the thing moves on. Whereas now it's become such a big deal that the next time they play, the umpires are going to be on top of everything. They're going to be warning anybody before a single pitch is even thrown. Uh, it, it's the media is going to be making a big mess out of it instead of just moving on. So to me, um, the reactions were a little strange. A damn media. I'll tell you what, a damn media. <laughs> Just Fox. Just yeah, Fox. Yeah, just yeah. And, no. and Max, Max, I talked about it. I, I talked about this earlier, and I said I've I've been in this situation, and same thing. I, and I knew I was going to get hit, and I was fine with it. I'm like, all right, just hit me, whatever, and move on. But they waited like two games. Aren't you just better off just throwing at a guy, getting it over with? Why wait two games? Like for me, I'm like, all right, you, you waited two games, and then you hit me. Like, what's the point in that? Like now, I'm just now I'm mad because you waited two games. Like you should have just done it. Got it over with and game situation, whatever, but still just get it over with. I've always been on the side of, you know, if there's retaliation that's needed and you know it's needed, just do it and then you move on. Every everyone's, you know, it's clear. It hey, you you, you got you got yours back. It's over and done with. You didn't go up my head. We're we're all good. Let's move on. Let's just play the game. Now nothing needs to be talked about. It's 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 done. Neither team's worrying about it because then you're getting into this thing where, okay, when's it coming? When's it coming? And then when it finally does come, like you said, if it's two games later, then it becomes a big deal again instead of just moving on from it. You feel like players should take care of this or you feel like the manager is the one, hey, this is when this is when we take care of this or, this, yeah, I'll tell you guys when we're going to throw at this player. Or do you think it should be something that the players take care of it on their own? I think it should be a little bit of both. You know, I think there needs to be an understanding between the manager and the players. Hey, there's certain times where, you know, this this requires it. And granted, you don't ever see that in today's game anymore. But, um, you know, there's certain times where, hey, just just put just just put one put one right in his back. It's not a big deal. We'll move on. And, you know, nothing happens from it. And I think there's times where the manager agrees with it. There's times where the players agree with it. But. Yeah, you don't see it as much in today's game anymore. I feel like that's something you saw. And, you know, I'm not an old school player in terms of my service time, but you saw that a lot back in the day. You just – guys would wear one, you move on. If you had another exception with it, then you might have slid hard into second base on a certain play. But, you know, you just you, – you took care of things on your own and you didn't, you didn't let it become these big deals and it just – you were able to move on from it. Do you like these rules? What rules? less contact i don't know because now you're like it from a safety perspective sure um yeah it's awesome we don't have to worry about as much but at the same time now these little ticky tack things are becoming these big deals because you can't take care of them um so you know i think it goes both ways on it yep fair um max back to the top here congratulations on the big dub um many more coming it was fun to watch, put on a show. More Thanks. bat flips. I need more bat flips. You want more at bats against lefties. Lefty starters. <laughs> but, but, by the way, I don't, I don't know. You can't see this, but I wore it for you. And we have Jeff Blum coming on, who also lives in, in Texas. So you're from Texas, but I don't know if we can get a single of my shirt or not. But it's just for you, Max. Uh, don't mess with Hold Texas. Oh, there we go. Don't mess with Texas, but definitely don't mess with – oh, come on. <laughs> well, i like how you got the alligator skull on there that's that's yeah it's about right yeah yeah nice uh max awesome game uh we'll talk to you down the road all right all right sounds great guys thank you appreciate you max muncie joining us on ft live and we'll jump right to that's what he said i have some quotes to read out first of all from that marlins pirates series so Jazz Chisholm post game. I love I love this. When I start to read something, I like to look at reactions. So Kratz, you'll you can raise your hand if you'd like. So Jazz against Pirates relievers um, said that the team struggled because they weren't used to playing under the open roof at Lone Depot Park in Miami, which is usually closed because you don't know when it's going to rain there. 
he said, quote, that we couldn't see. That's all. I feel like the shadows were really, we're not used to playing in shadows. We normally play inside every day. So when we get a shadow for three of the four games at home for the first time this season, it's kind of hard to adjust to. You know we're used to the roof being closed and being able to see every at-bat. It's kind of tough to see when it's black out there and you're facing a guy throwing 101, you know? It's, it is definitely tough to see. How many guys do you ever hear say this in the media though? So like, is he, is he, does he need to say it? Everybody's thinking it. AJ, how hard was it to hit in a day game in Chicago? I tell you who didn't have a problem with it. The pirates, when they were whacking balls, rowdy was facing guys throwing hundred and he was going dead center. I mean, their pirates didn't have any, seem to have any problems. So I don't understand. I mean, that's, that's the thing. Like, okay, great. You couldn't see. Neither could the other team. Didn't have a problem. They were whacking balls all over the place. Also, what do you mean by didn't see? Like, it, you clearly saw a ball 100 miles an hour and were able to freaking torch yeah, it. He did hit a grand slam in this series. I mean, I don't know. I, I feel like this is just – this is I don't know why, why. You don't need to say this. Like, what, what's – That's it. Just don't say it. Like, because then you look – you just look – I mean, listen, I don't know Jazz Chisholm at all. And, I mean, if people think they love his game. And, listen, he's done a lot of really cool things with his swag and – and I like that kind of stuff, right? But there are times where you're just like, dude, we got our butts kicked, man. Like, just, hey, give credit to the Pirates. Because, again, they didn't have any problems seeing. They scored 31 runs in four games. So, what are you saying? And then when you're like, oh, the guy's throwing 101. Well, your guys were throwing, what, 98? So, they have to throw 101 to be able not to see? I mean, I, I don't know. I mean, maybe he was just talking about the last of that. He's frustrated. But it just comes across as kind of like, eh, why? You don't, you don't want to come across like that. You don't want to come across with excuses. It's not to me, that kind of stuff permeates the clubhouse too. Like when a guy would come back, I don't know if you ever faced this AJ, but guys would come back, couldn't see a thing. Like he was like kind of putting a parachute out there for himself. Couldn't see anything. Some dudes go up to the plate then they're like, oh, what is it? What is it? Is it the batter's eye? What, what couldn't he see? What? And really it's just, people being emotional about not having the success that they want to have. But like you said, like pirates didn't have an issue. They were staying on the ball. The, they didn't close the roof and then reopen it for, for the Marlins. Like, I don't know, just, you got You got to kind of have a little more feel there. In my opinion, there's definitely places that are tough to see. Not saying shadows are easy. Milwaukee tough shadows during day games. That, you know, in Miami, it looked like that was a tough shadow. Absolutely. But you got to bear down. You're not giving up your at-bats. It happens everywhere in the day, though. It happens in L.A. It happens in San Fran. It happens everywhere. Ooh. The shadows creep across. I mean, there's always going to be a shadow of something. So, But both teams deal with it. It wasn't like these games were one to nothing and nobody could get a hit. I mean, these were high-scoring games. The last game was a great game. Back and forth. Rowdy with the big homer went to extra. Uh, Nick Gordon with the homer in the ninth to – I mean, was Nick Gordon didn't have problems seeing a hundred from Bednar when he went deep <laughs> to right. Uh, I mean, it's like, all right, well, then the next, you know, uh, Belay, Delay, Jason Delay, bunts perfect bunt. They scored two runs, right? O'Neill Cruz, the safety squeeze. It was just, I don't know, it just why? Well, just no reason to say this. Everyone knows, and the broadcasters will be like, oh, there's bad shadows. Okay, it covers it. Yeah, exactly. You would think that there's like a shadow master. Like, oh, Marlins are coming up. Put them back. Also, it's not like the Marlins scored two runs. They scored 17 runs in four games. That's not terrible. That's over four runs a game. That's better than league average. Yeah. In a ballpark. They lost one run games, which they won all the time last year. Well, and that's where the margins can very quickly edge the other way. That's why I didn't pick them for the postseason. As I agree, as did I. Also, what? Yeah, move. move. you You signed Tim Anderson. Almost your entire staff is on the IL. It's going to be tough. It's going to be a tough run. Um, in that division, also for that's what he said, this was great. David O'Brien posting about a conversation in the clubhouse, which you're allowed to post about. It's when the media was in there. Backtrack to FT last year if you need more context in October. So O'Brien says, as reporters approached Orlando Arcia after his second straight three-hit game, Ronald Acuna Jr., who was seated next to him, tapped him and said, attaboy, Arcia, and walked away laughing. How come David O'Brien's not getting shit? Because they won the game. That's right. So do you think the Braves have kind of loosened up a little bit? No, I think Acuna, by saying that, made it 
diffused it like we were just talking about with the McNeil and the whole when you're going to throw at him. Yeah. He diffused it right there. It's over with now. That a boy, Arcia, and you can say it was a moment. You know what it is? It was a moment where it's over and we move on and, you know, it was it, it was kind of a, from it. Yeah, his teammates having his back basically and saying, we got you. And here, I'll say it again. Didn't shy away from it. I love it. I think that is such good feel by Acuna too. Such good feel. Like perfect timing. Didn't say it pregame. Although he did give the he did he did kind of taunt the crowd as he was coming out for opening day. Acuna. I love it. I love it. <laughs> if he's the lead if he's the leader of that team on the field, that to me, that's the kind of stuff like that that it brings the clubhouse together and it it just it just diffuses situations. It allows guys to be like, oh yeah, you know, whatever. We're moving on. Well, let's uh, infuse the Brewers Mets situation again with Tim Britton, senior writer at the Athletic, covering the Mets. We'll talk Mets Brewers here. Tim, great to have you on. And how fun was that opening series from an entertainment perspective? Uh, probably depends who you're a partisan of. For a, a Mets fan, that was not their favorite opening weekend. This is a team that generally does really well on opening day, at least. Uh, and so now they're they're 0-3, and, and, and pretty much any concern you could have had about the New York Mets going into the regular season was uh, was justified a little bit that opening weekend. Well, what were the concerns? The lineup, the starters, the bullpen? <laughs> Which yeah, one? just those three. I mean, I mean, throw, throw defense in there too if you want to. Um, you know, I, I think the, the main one was probably the rotation that that maybe the, this rotation, especially without Kodai Senga, just doesn't have the goods. Right, is, is not good enough at the top. Is not deep enough uh, to, to get this team to the postseason. Uh, and then you had three starts where they went uh, four and two thirds, five and four. Tyler McGill's last start on Sunday was cut short by tenderness in his shoulder, just adds to their their issues in the rotation. You know, they don't have that guy that you expect to go six, let alone seven consistently without Senga in there. Uh, Luis Severino, who had a really nice spring, was healthy in spring for the first time since 2018, gave up a dozen hits in five innings the other day. Uh, so uh, I think that that's the main concern. But also, if you weren't sure if this lineup could overcome any kind of slumps from their key players, you know, Brandon Nimmo and Francisco Lindor basically didn't hit this opening weekend. Uh, they didn't score very many runs. So uh, it was it was not a weekend to remember for the Mets. First of all, there's very few things that I know, but I like your hats. I know I like your hats <laughs> in the background, okay? So I appreciate that. This is Overreaction Monday. This is Overreaction Monday. If we knew all these things were concerns, what is the overreaction now that we've watched an entire series of the Mets? That, because basically all the things that you said, you know, Severino giving up hits and McGill not being able to, you know, tenderness in his arm and Senga not out there, we knew all this stuff. So is this just going to be status quo or is there some kind of overreaction that, that we're missing with the Mets? I mean, I, I think you can qualify, qualify any talk of like the offense not being good enough is, is maybe an overreaction because again, you know, Nimmo and Lindor are going to hit over the course of the season. And there were some good signs in the second half of the order. Starling Marte, you know, I'm running his first half out of the season uh, and looked healthier than he did really at any point last year. Brett Beatty hit a pinch hit home run on Saturday. Francisco Alvarez launched a home run. You know, if this Mets offense is going to overcome whatever pitching deficiencies they have, they're going to need more than that top third of the order. So they're going to need guys like Alvarez to break out, Beatty to be closer to a league average player, Marte to be closer to who he was in 22 than in 23. And from an offense perspective, you've got J.D. Martinez coming down the line. This is not the lineup they're, they're planning to use for 162 games. Uh, they're probably not going to have too many more games with Jeff McNeil and Tyrone Taylor as their cleanup hitters once Martinez gets here. So I think that that's maybe where an overreaction is. That's where the Mets hope it's only an overreaction. Uh, and then, you know, they, their hope is that the pitching side of thing kind of stabilizes starting tonight with Sean Manaya. Tim, I hate to go here just a few games in, but I felt like it was a conversation last year. What are the team chemistry vibes? You know, what do you hear maybe off the record from the team last year compared to this year? Because it seemed like some players were in quicksand to support McNeil during the little altercation. It, it's, that's a, a, a weird spot, obviously, to happen in the second game. Of, and sorry, in the first game of the season uh, with, with McNeil at second base. You know, he's a fiery player. We, we know what he's had in his past with with Francisco Lindor dating back to their first season together. Lindor did back him up and said, I've got his back 100 percent of the time. Uh, how they handled that on Saturday. I mean, you guys can probably speak to it even better than I, than I can. Was a little confusing, uh, a little weird, not not exactly what, what anyone expected. Uh, and so uh, I think it's it's worth asking for a team that. 
you know, in 2021 had some clubhouse issues down the stretch of that season. Uh, last year just never seemed to gel. I, I will give them credit here in that last year, like that team really could have gone in the tank in August and September after the moves they made. And they didn't. They played pretty well, actually, after uh, about the second week of August. Uh, so uh, I, I think it's not uh you don't go into the season expecting things to, to go south and, and get really ugly. Uh, but in New York, that is always a possibility. Uh, and so it, it's important early in the season. They don't have the easiest early season schedule uh, for them to, to kind of right the ship and get going under a first year manager in Carlos Mendoza. Tim, is Ramirez now a Mets like folk hero for what he did? I mean, he did not miss him by like six feet, which I love Hoskins. And then I know you wrote the article, but tell our viewers, where, where does Hoskins rank on Mets villains right now? I mean, first with Ramirez, you know, the, the, there is a, a rich history of Mets, Mets pitchers missing too, by too much behind guys. Uh, everyone remembers Sean Estes and Roger Clemens. Ramirez, unfortunately, doesn't get the opportunity to hit a home run off Reese Hoskins the way Estes did uh, with Clemens back in, in 2001. Uh, you know, Hoskins, the, the, to me, uh, as you kind of looking at the last generation of Mets villains, there is that Mount Rushmore of, of Clemens and, and John Rocker, uh, uh, Chipper Jones and Chase Utley. Uh, you know, I think Hoskins isn't quite at that level, but for guys currently in Major League Baseball uh, and and terrorizing the Mets, uh, Hoskins might be number one among current players right now. More, you didn't even mention Jimmy Rollins. Jimmy Rollins said that the NL East goes through Philadelphia, and that kind of turned the ire the ire of the Mets to towards Jimmy Rollins for a little while. I guess Chase broke Ruben Tejada's leg. I guess that that puts him up there, but. Yeah, I mean, you, you, I mean, like you can honestly pick out any member of the 20, 2007 Phillies or the 99 Braves and you'll get a Mets fan angry. Like, it, it's, it's that easy. Uh, so I, I think th those are the teams that probably stick in, in Mets fans' craws more than anyone. I'll, I'll do anything to get under a Mets fan. I, one of my best <laughs> friends is a Mets fan, so I'll use all those names and more. But they're kind of squalloring right now in their own sorrow. What about the Brewers? What did you see from a team that – constantly year in and year out is picked to finish below 500 and then they come out and they do this to the Mets in the opening day series in New York what did you see from them specifically certain players that really stuck out to you yeah I mean it, it's a team that maximizes what it does well right like they're, they're athletic they stole eight bases in three games they play excellent defense I think they, they led all of baseball and defensive runs saved over the opening weekend, uh, according to Baseball Info Solutions. They, they saved six defensive runs in three games. Uh, so they're going to do those little things that, you know, don't jump out at you on a baseball reference page really well. Uh, you know, I think Freddie Peralta looked like uh, one of the five best pitchers in, in the National League with his opening day start on, on Friday. Uh, Christian Yelich had a bunch of hits over the weekend. And then there's Jackson Churio, who we're all seeing for the first time on a major league, uh, at the major league level, uh, looking 100% like he belongs. So there's a lot of young talent in Milwaukee. A lot, you know, you, you're going to go through ups and downs with that. But if it blossoms, it, it can blossom really well uh, and make up for kind of the losses they've experienced over the offseason in losing Burns and, and Woodruff to injury. Because of who Steve Cohen is and what he's building around this team and the money he has, could the Mets and the Mets fans ever have a team like the Brewers? Like you said, they're young. They're going to make young mistakes, but they play defense and they maximize what they have. Could the Mets ever do that or in the market that they're in? Not a chance. I mean, their, their plan is to do all those little things, maximize those fringes well, while also having star players there, um, you know, and, and, main, and keeping those star players for a long period of time. You know, I, I think there's an issue right now with like their position player prospects that they, they've brought up the last couple of years. Guys like uh, Brett Beatty and, and Mark Mientos were bat first guys who haven't developed quite as much defensively as they would have liked. That was kind of their old drafting strategy under Sandy Alderson and co for a while. So David Stern's coming in that that draft strategy will probably evolve over time. Uh, so maybe you get more athleticism into their lineup. They've already done it a little bit with the prospects they added last year at the deadline. You know, uh, Luis Angel Acuna and Drew Gilbert in particular are guys who can be defensive pluses for them if and when they get to the major leagues with the Mets. So I, I think, you know, the, the plan is to have all of those components and add Steve Cohen spending on top of it. It's just you've got to be patient with it and you've got to live through periods like this, a, a year that they've been pretty frank ever since the trade deadline last year that their expectations this season were not going to be what they were going in to 22 and 23. Uh, and that's a, that's a tough play in this market. And, and Stearns himself has admitted, you, you know, you're never going to take a year off in New York the way you might in Milwaukee, the way he had to, to kind of build that roster his first year with the Brewers. You don't get quite that luxury here, but the Mets are going to try to push that kind of as much as they push that patience as much as they can here in 2024. 
And Tim, Steve Cohen spoke again recently to the media, right? I think it was this weekend where they asked him if the playoff miss would be a disappointment, if that's what the result would be. And obviously he said, yeah, sure. But did you take anything from his comments? Because it's a weird spot. First of all, as an owner who actually speaks out, who obviously gives you guys time, which many others don't. But is it a weird spot for him because they are really going through a mini rebuild? You know, it's always appreciated that, that Cohen actually does make time to talk to us multiple times per year. You don't you don't get that with a lot of owners. Uh, I, I do think, you know, the, the thing that jumped out to me most was that he said that getting under the, that initial luxury tax threshold is not like a goal and not something the Mets have to do to kind of reset those penalties. He's, he's candid that, you know, they're in the 110% tax threshold right now. So making additions like the one they made for J.D. Martinez costs them more than they would like at this point. Uh, you know, $12 million salary counts like $25 million basically. Um, but uh, that he's planning, you know, even with the, the issues they had last year with, with how they spent money on, on veteran pitchers not working out, uh, that he still plans to run a, a, a payroll commensurate with his wealth and with the market. Uh, and that getting under that threshold and resetting the penalties the way the Yankees have, the way the Dodgers have for individual seasons is not something he feels necess necessary to do, which means that they can spend, you know, a lot this upcoming winter when they need to re-sign Pete Alonso, they can go after guys like Corbin Burns and Juan Soto, and then kind of build off of uh, a roster that they hope evolves over the course of this season and has some young players break out. All right, you got to take us on a tour before we let you go here. <laughs> Give us your favorite hat that's in the back, because right now my favorite – has to be the Expos hat. There is no doubt that is an A plus hat. Looks like it's been kind of in a box for a little bit, but I understand. <laughs> I'm a hat connoisseur. Sometimes it's tough to which one's your favorite and give us a unique one. Yeah, I mean the, the Expos pinwheel is is a favorite of, of most anyone who sees it. Uh, there is kind of the like the the theme going on at least on one side is like teams that don't exist anymore. So. Uh, one of my favorites is the, the, the Hartford Whalers here with uh, Pucky the Whale. Uh, you know, you got the, the HW logo everyone loves, uh, but Pucky is a great, a great second, second hat for that team. So that, that's the one I go with. Nice. Is he related to Fudgy the Whale at Carvel? <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure. I'm sure they get together at family reunions. You know, <laughs> <laughs> they look alike, don't they? They kind of do actually. Yeah. If, if they have a whale Pucky of a time too. <laughs> All right, well, you get an A for the collection. We great hats at the end of every show. So it was great to have you on, Tim. Appreciate the time. You can follow Tim at Tim Britton, B-R-I-T-T-O-N. Catch his work every day in The Athletic covering the Mets. We'd love to have you back. Thanks, Tim. Oh, anytime. Thanks for having me. Thank you. All right, we'll move to an unfortunate segment. Injuries suck. Yes, they do. Uh, you know... I'm going to start with Royce Lewis because we talked about it last week, but he left game one with a quad issue. It ends up being a significant quad strain. Sounds like it's going to be a multiple month injury. Brooks Lee is currently on the IL. That's one of the young top prospects they have who you've also heard from on this show recently. Um, so twins depth being tested, but really you're not going to replace Royce Lewis right now. I mean, Royce Lewis is, an elite bat in the league when he's played, but can you imagine how he's feeling after jumping into the first game, going two for two with a homer and then leaving? Well, it sucks. Um, but he's has, he's been so injured. That, this yeah. is the one wor thing we always worry about with Royce Lewis is can he stay on the field? I mean, I know ACLs are you know not. I mean, just kind of acts of God, right? Like bad luck, whatever you want to call it, but force majeure, whatever they you mm -hmm. know they you want to say, but. Gosh, you know, then to, to be out for another two months. I'm, listen, the Twins are very – they slow play a lot of injuries. They don't rush guys back a lot. Um, but, man, you know, Royce going down for two months, this definitely hurts the Twins. There, there's no doubt about it. And then you, you lose Brooke Lee, Brooks Lee, who's going to probably fill in for him. Who plays third? I don't know. Um, but, you know, now you need Buxton to step up. You need some of these other guys to step up even more. Correa to step up. The pitching staff to step up. But Royce Lewis was – a guy they were counting on to carry a lot of this offense, especially what he did last year and then in the postseason and then two for two with a homer and then, oh, no, he's out for two months. It's just – it sucks for the Twins. It sucks for the organization, and it sucks for Royce Lewis. I can't – I can't get over when a guy – when people are always saying, oh, guy's injury prone, he's injury prone. Like, what does that – what does that even mean? But when they're all – It means he gets injuries, hurt a lot. It means he yeah. gets hurt a lot. <laughs> it means he gets hurt. And, it, and you can't do anything – like – when it's leg injuries, you feel like it could be preventable, but maybe there's different things like like somebody gets hit in the hand by a pitch. 
Some people's hands break when 95 hits them. Some people are, to me, I think you're lucky if it doesn't break, bones don't break because you're playing at a max peak level. You're going to, you're going to get hurt. And some people are fortunate enough, they're minor. That's the biggest thing out of this whole, this whole, you know, even for the twins is the fact that you sit here and you go two months without the guy that could be MVP, could carry an entire lineup out of all the injuries that we're going to talk about today. I think the twins were the least prepared or least depth to be able to handle it because of what he brings to the lineup because of what his hope and presence in that hope it enabled them to get rid of a Jorge Polanco because you know what? Royce Lewis is going to come back. I know it's not the same position, but he's going to give us offense that, you know, he'll, he'll mitigate what's going, what's going on in the lineup without Jorge in there. And now they don't have that. Let me ask you a question for some inside player perspective here. Buxton has had a lot of lower body injuries as well. Super athlete. Great when he's on the field. The next injury we're going to cover is DJ LeMahieu, who we were talking about for the last week or two with a bone bruise. Turns out it's a non-displaced fracture in his foot. He'll get checked out again in a couple weeks, so he's going to miss significant time. And some Yankee fans on social media were freaking out. They're like, this happens pretty frequently, you know, misdiagnosis or kind of a bad evaluation. Are we overthinking that? I mean, how different are medical staffs on a team-by-team basis? And with certain parts of the body, right? Some doctors specialize in certain areas. That's why it's key to get second opinions. That's why you're mm-hmm. allowed to get second opinions. So why you you need to get second opinions if you're a major leaguer. And yeah, I mean, DJ LeMayu, I mean, is this the Anthony Rendon thing where he said he had a bruise and the team was saying he had a broken leg? I mean, that's obviously not gotten to that point, but still, I mean, this sucks for LeMayu. They didn't miss him those first four games, though. They're thinking, like, man, maybe. Maybe we'll use some other people. I don't know, but it sucks for DJ. And it's you just never want to see anybody get hurt. Like getting hurt is the worst. Like that, just the worst thing. This is the worst for your team, for your own morale. Sometimes team morale, but sometimes it brings guys together. You, you fight through adversity. The whole like certain body parts or teams not good at diagnosing. I, I don't. I don't know about that. You know, it have to be like a reoccurring thing. But you sit there and you go is this team doing everything they can from a medical standpoint? And if they are as a team, you look at it and you go, okay, that's fine. But there is a huge difference in medical staffs throughout the league in the sense that some of them are really connected to the strength program, to the, to the front office who's connected to the lineup. And they're not fighting against each other. Like the medical staff isn't sitting there going, guys, our algorithm says you shouldn't play this guy. Kind of like what we had about with when Buck was on. And he's sitting there going, well, I'm the manager. I want these guys to play. And the front office is like, well, we want them to stay safe. We want them to – teams that flow in the same direction and have a plan, kind of like we heard J.P. Fireisen talking about it, how the strength coaches know what kind of stuff the medical staff did, the, the athletic trainers did. And all that is fed then to the manager, and he ultimately makes the decision of who plays. But they make the decision as a group. So, yeah, there's a big difference. Not saying that the Twins are bad because Buxton and Royce Lewis keep getting have lower body injuries. Just saying there's a huge difference in the way medical staffs are run. AJ would be a prime example to talk about that. <coughs> yeah, but teams all do it the same way. It's not like there's a huge difference. They all go through the same stuff. I mean, a lot of these head trainers were – the assistant trainer in another place before they get the head trainer job. So it's not like they don't know what they're doing. It's all run kind of the same way. So it's just kind of every team I was on was run the same way. Granted, I didn't go in the training room when at all possible, but uh, you know, most of the, what the trainer would, the trainer would sit down talk to the strength guy. Hey, we have, this guy has this barking. Let's go through this. They talk to the massage person. They talk to the, the, you know, the acupuncturist, they talk to the, whoever they have, you know, all these people. And then they'd, Say, all right, now with the manager, we go to the manager and say, hey, here's what we got. He's sore. Can he play? And then the manager ultimately makes the decision. But usually the manager also would talk to the player. And the player would get a last say. I mean, I know there was times where whoever my manager was like, I know you're a little sore. You want to play? And I'd be like, yeah. <laughs> like, I'm just sore. Like, it's okay. I can play with sore. I've been sore plenty of times. 
you know, there's a difference obviously between sore and hurt, which I, I, I get. And I'm not saying either, you know, these guys aren't, they're not hurt, right? They are. But it, it always was like, there was guys I saw the manager come out and say, Hey, I know you're a little banged up. You want to play? And they're like, no, I'll take the day. Okay. Oh. Fine. That's their decision. But that's their decision. You know, and you can't ever, you can, one thing I always say is you can never put a, I can never tell you how bad you're hurt. I can never tell you how bad someone else is hurt because I'm not living in their body. I can only worry about my body and how I feel. And, you know, I, I, I honestly just, it sucks. That's it. That's it. There's all you can say is injuries suck. It happens to every team. Whoever handles them the best is usually who's on top of the end. In the modern game where I think sometimes less homework is done on a free agent, is the player better off not playing sometimes? Does that make sense? Like if you're if you're debating playing, if you're debating playing in a game, and you're like, ah, I'm really feeling it. I could use a day, but I could play. But no. I'm going to be a free agent soon, and most teams won't know if I was grinding and went an extra day for them. You know, like what what's the reward as a player? The investment in yourself. That's not a thing. Just wondering from the fan perspective. I mean, guys, I like want to play. Guys, guys. They should want to play. Like there shouldn't be like, oh, I'm gonna take a day. What is this major league with Dorn? Or what do you want me to dive? I mean, what are we talking about here? Like, <laughs> doesn't even make any sense. Bryce Harper completely played it safe in his free agent year. If you look at how often he dives and goes crazy for baseballs, there's literally a stat for it. You didn't, you didn't, know, you don't remember this at the time? Never. I can never find heard it. it. Diving, sliding, all of that for now a baseball he's in into, the outfield. Now he's jumping into camera wells for no reason. <laughs> Which I'm all about. And there, I mean, there, there's a happy medium, I'm sure. But yes, it was a thing. I'll, I should be able to find. If you it. try not to get hurt, it doesn't. Like that, you just gotta play. Like you can't try not to get hurt. Like it doesn't no. happen. Like because you can try not to get hurt, and the guy throws one at your ribs, and you break a rib, and you're like, well, sorry, I was trying not to get hurt. I mean, you can't, you can't go into a game, you can't go into a year saying I'm not going to get hurt. The league is too good. Play. The league is too good to have any shred of doubt. Like you can't be like, I don't know. I, I don't know if I'm going to turn on this ball. I'm going to foul it off my shin or I'll just let this one drop. You know how to mitigate injuries. You know, okay, my hamstrings, my hamstrings a little tight. I got to make sure I don't, I don't try to, you know, start and stop too fast or you have to like you, but other than that, I don't know. I don't know. Again, I'm not, I never tried to reach free agency, so I don't know about trying to keep myself healthy. I had to do everything I could to just be on the field, not not try to eliminate injury. So you got to you got to play hard. Ready? I, I kind of found it. I think this twenty eighteen. One dive, four slides. Twenty sixteen and seventeen, eleven dives, seventeen slides. How do we know that wasn't just the circumstances of the game? Oh, it could be. I, I mean, plus, you're, add, you're adding multiple years together. So whoever came up with this, stat, yeah, save stupid. it. Save it. They're just looking for something. That's just stupid. How do we? <laughs> how do you know? I mean, every every year, every situation is different. I mean, come on. That's it's it's it's. it's you know what that is? That's probably a Nationals fan being like, "Hey, you know, Bryce didn't want to be a National, so I'm going to find a way <laughs> to make him look stupid." <laughs> All right, what about Braves fans? They actually lost a really big part of their team. It's just that everyone's a big part of their team because they're so stacked. But Sean Murphy has a grade one left oblique strain. Brian Snicker said his manager, it's best case scenario, no tear, all that. But still going to miss some time. You have Travis Darno to back things up, and I feel like the Braves will be okay. Yeah, but Sean Murphy had a great year for him last year. So yeah. I, I don't want this to be underrepresented or under-discussed how big he was. I mean, he kind of... They kind of went into the season saying they're going to 50-50 split, and then Sean Murphy was like the best player in the league the first half of the year. So, I mean, he struggled a little bit in the second half, and Travis Darno was a great backup slash other 1B, I guess they call him, 1A, 1B. Uh, so so I think I think that's fine. Um, but this is a big deal. Obliques don't necessarily go away very quickly. I mean, he's probably looking at a month out. So, you know, but again, the Braves, if there's one team that can handle this, it's the Braves because they have dip, what they call it, Chadwick Trump and mm – -hmm. So they have they have other options. The Braves have built death, Alex Anthopoulos, and let's not forget Chris Sale pitched pretty well yesterday too. He did. He did. Travis Darno, all star catcher, is your backup catcher, and they were kind of running it, not as like your typical like the rest of the Braves team plays every single day. Murph was getting in there. Sean Murphy was getting in there, getting some 
getting some DHs last year. I assume they were going to kind of push the same envelope with the amount of at-bats that he gets. Darno is a really good backup plan. What would you say, 1B plan? Like, he was almost an all-star last year after Murphy was an all-star. So, they'll be fine. Again, this is how the teams that deal with injuries. How many teams could say, oh, man, our all-star catcher went down? But we're fine. We're fine. We'll we'll, we'll, be, able, we'll be able to last for this month. Well, Braves. Like, even the Dodgers. Like, you can't go putting Austin Barnes in there every single day, and you have an all-star catcher. Phillies. Garrett Stubbs putting him in there every day, and now the Braves, they get to turn around and be like, oh, yeah, Travis Darno. Oh, seriously? Like, that's who they get? That's why this team is – that's why I picked them to be the first wild card. At least on the days that Travis Darno doesn't play, you might have one spot in the lineup that you can go, yo, we should get this guy. All right. Call, call Chad with Trump and tell him that. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm just saying, look at the lineup. I mean, they had a – Pretty successful weekend. Even Duval has the Kelnick insurance that they don't need right now. I, there was the quote. I think we were going to get to it, but you can just mix it in here. Uh, I think it was from one of the Braves beat writers. They were like, who was worried about Kelnick spring training? Overreaction. It's been three games. Let's everyone take a deep breath. Okay. Well, let's let's go back to where Kelnick, and I'm not saying Kelnick's a bad player. I know Kelnick had a great, you know, until he kicked the Gatorade jug last year. Mm-hmm. But let's let's – He's not going to be Ronald Acuna. He's not going to be Bryce Harper. He's a good player, but let's let's. It was three games. Let's let's everyone take a step back. I think it'll be helpful for him that he's not in a lineup where the Mariners needed him to continue to be the MVP candidate he was in the first half. What kind of pressure that is? I will have no. I have no idea. I can't speak on that. But he was hot, and they pinch hit Duvall for him. Oh, Duvall came up with a big hit. So they don't need him to be anything more than, you know, what he was this this series. But agreed. Like let's not let's not let's not etch his name in the MVP plaque quite yet. Yeah, and vice versa. I mean, he pinch hit yesterday for Trump and got a double. My point on the spring training side was t- Tommy Pham, who deserves to be on a team right now tweeted this weekend from watching these games with this free time one huge observation and speaking from experience spring training stats do not matter from experience and observations most guys are trying things out and if it doesn't work by a certain time we just revert back to old ways true of course yeah actually i fell for that i was doing a show giving picks and I was like, I think Mike Soroka's K-Prop might look a little better. Striking a lot of dudes out, looking different in spring training. He had no case. He was the same old Soroka, which was fine, but he was the sinker ball, ground ground ball city. I fell for it. Don't fall for it. I've been telling you for years, spring training in September, the most overrated months in the world. September? Used to be. Not anymore. We used, used to, to have be. a 40-man. Yeah. Yeah. Used to be when it was a 40-man roster and you call up a guy and you'd be like, Oh, this guy had a great two weeks. He got 25 at bats or 30 at bats. And they're like, oh, he's definitely on the team. And then you get him up the next year and he doesn't hit as well. Doesn't play as well. When he's got to face not all September call up or not half September call ups. Wasn't that the story with the Padres last year? They finished winning, what, 14 of 16, something like that? Yeah, and they, they got over 500. And everyone's like, oh, they're back. And then, like, but all of those games, I don't want to say they were meaningless. They were still, quote, in it, but. Wasn't that different baseball for them? Well, of course. I mean, they were. Pressure was off. They were pressure. definitely pressure off. Pressure off the pedal. Um, all right. We're going to talk to Jeff Blum coming up in a sec. We have to. What's the relationship like? Can you give me this, uh, a little preview? <laughs> I mean, I love Blummer. When we, almost 20 years ago today, we beat his Houston Astros in the World Series. So, uh <laughs> I mean, we have a great relationship. Every time I go there, I try to mess with him a little bit because he never he's never at the games when I'm there. Because oh, when, because you're doing fine. National broadcast comes in, the, the local guys get the day off. So he's yeah. he's with his like seven kids he has. He has triplets, I think. <laughs> Triplet girls are all in college. Triplets? Yeah, I think they're all in college too. All scholarships. I think they some of them have I think they played volleyball. Oh, so then yes. I was kind of being sarcastic. Otherwise, that's an expensive <laughs> little run. keep working. Yeah. 
Um, all right, but we'll talk Astros, Yankees. We've been saving this one up. We can talk Yanks for a sec, though, while he's getting warmed up. Is, is Juan Soto good? Is that a decent pickup? It's a decent yeah. pickup. Decent pickup. Let's see. Overreaction? No. Or you think he'll you think he's gonna no. get he's gonna get cold? Well, he's always gonna everyone gets cold. He was my, cold in spring training. My, my, yeah, he couldn't hit. Remember he didn't go to Mexico City? Mm-hmm. Um here's my question is again, I was in San Diego last this weekend, right? And talking to people mm-hmm. that he he like didn't fit there. Why? Why? And now everyone's like, "Oh, he's such a great fit in New York." Like, why? Why didn't he fit in San Diego? But now he fits in the. It's like it's is he fit because he he won four games for him. First four games. I don't. It was. It's so weird because it's not. It's like he changed anything. And then I was watching, uh, you know, a show this morning, and they were like, "Oh, he's off to a great start. He's really trying this year." Well, we wonder why. And I'm like. Uh, Because it's his free agent year and he's in New York. Maybe that's why he's trying this year. I don't know. People like overreaction is funny to me when you're like, yeah, he's really locked in this year from the start. I'm like, because he's a free agent at the end of the year, maybe. Do you think he wasn't, he wasn't locked in last year? No, he was. I'm not saying that. I'm the other. That's but like, it's like, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. Like, no, of course he was locked in. I mean, listen, there were times. Listen, I know if you've watched him though, over the years, there've been times where people are like, why doesn't he swing? He'd go up there and take three heaters right in the middle, and you're like, why didn't he swing? And nobody could figure it out. You know, I'm not questioning whether he's locked in or not. I know he's locked in. But, listen, you go to New York, and then you go into your free agent year, guess what? There's got every – you're human. So every person has to, like, Oop, okay, I got to I gotta lock it in even more. Mm-hmm. I'm sorry. That's just human nature. Yeah, different org. I mean, different chemistry behind the scenes, too. San Diego had a lot of mm-hmm. shit going on. I think it was beyond. But that just doesn't losing. matter, though. If you ask people, mm. it doesn't matter. Yeah, it mm. doesn't matter when players are not getting along. Who's the leader? The GM and the manager hate each other. Do they though? Just saying. Uh, Astros broadcaster Jeff Blum joining the show right now to break down more of the Yankees Astros series. All right, here you go, Blummer. Here's your boys. Say hi to whoever you want. Yeah. Hey, Cratch. How's it going, dude? Hey. <laughs> So that's really selfish of you to hang your jersey in the background. Okay, that's like, are you looking for like self promotion or something? Absolutely, any chance I can, dude. I'm buried down here in Texas. I got to get my name out there every chance I get. And of course, I miss my good buddy AJ. How you doing, dude? First of all, let me ask why. I'm going to ask this as nice as I can. Why the fuck do you have a Astros jersey with gold numbers on it? Because you didn't win shit when you were there. Hey, dude, I tell you what, I have gained more gold shit in the last five, seven years than I got in the whole year or a whole three months I had to spend with you. What do you mean? You got you got your one and only gold ring that you had, you, you know, know you worked so hard for. You got one fucking at bat, and now you think you're a World Series hero because you got one at bat. Hey, yeah, 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 yeah. Hey. Hey, I my statue that. is the on the other side of your statue. That's all I know. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I maximized most... my potential. Okay, so I asked uh, when I was in Houston. I, you weren't there because, of course, you were on vacation the day I was in Houston for spring training down in Palm Beach, okay? Yeah, you were, you know, at the beach. You working on your tan, whatever. I don't know what you were doing, but I was talking to Gene, you know, mean Gene, the, the PR guy there. And I said, well, you know, Blummer doesn't come in. And I said, you know, how does it go? Like when Blummer, you know, the White Sox, you know, and da 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 da. And I'm like, you know, they've really welcomed him, you know, after he was hated there, after he hit that one home run. And he's like, Blum's not allowed to ever talk about that. He doesn't even, it's like it never happened. He's like, what? it just never, ever happened. Dude, the first three years I sat in that booth for Houston, uh, you know, first of all, th- they announced the hiring that I'm coming back. And, you know, I got booed when I came back in 2008. Uh, as, as an Astro again, and then I come, get announced as the uh, broadcaster for the Astros, and I get I get booed incessantly. And I know you guys know about uh, Astro social media; they're rather fervent. And uh, any time in the first three years I sat in that booth, and if anybody said 2005, my Twitter feed would just absolutely release hell on me, saying, "How is this guy in the booth?" But uh, Obviously, good looks, charisma, personality, and completely <laughs> sucking up to this fan base has, has endeared me to them. But, you know, funny story, in 2017, kind of realized that the Astros are going to be semi-decent and make a run in the playoffs. And I quietly pulled A.J. Hinch off to the side and I said, hey, man, you know, 
if you could pull this thing off and actually win this World Series, you'd be doing me a huge solid right now and kind of take that monkey off my back. So uh, he, he did me a solid and then backed up in 2022. And I think all things are forgiven now. All right. So since about 2015, this team has been this dominant team. Since it's overreaction Monday, do we sit here and go, they're 0, 0 and 4? This is the end of the run. When are they trading Bregman? What are we, but what really is, what really is the issue that the Astros who have had the Yankees number, AJ Przezinski said it here last year, Yankees ain't doing nothing as long as the Astros are in nope. the American League. Susan Waldman said it. I just was related. Susan Waldman <laughs> said it. <laughs> well, regular season is different than the postseason. The Astros obviously show up in the postseason because we saw this last year with uh, the New York Yankees. They went on a tear and everybody said they were going to win 120 games and break what the uh, Seattle Mariners did in 2001. And all of a sudden, they flamed out. They had injuries, couldn't put a put a uh, starting rotation together, and they kind of faded at the end as Baltimore began to rise up. Um, but yeah, you know what? Through four games, uh, the field down here is a little bit different than it has been in the past. And I think it's pretty easy if you actually sit back and don't overreact and say they're never going to go to the playoffs again. You actually can pinpoint what's wrong with this ball club because the starting rotation is yet to give up a home run. They have done a very good job of pitching into those fourth, fifth innings, which is usually typical in the first couple of outings that you have coming out of spring training with some of these pitchers. But the loss of Naris, Stanek, and Maton is kind of is kind of exaggerated right now because you did nothing. Dana Brown did nothing to replace them other than bring up AAA guys or bringing a guy like Taylor Scott, who's a really good story and pitched actually relatively well yesterday. But are you going to get that consistent guy that's going to post every single time he gets that baseball? Uh, Stanek was a guy that would throw in the fifth through the seventh through the eighth, ninth innings. Neris was uh, miraculous in how he got out of some situations. And Maton was a nice little wrinkle with the off speed and the spin that he brought. But there's nobody really to replace that bridge in order to get from your starter to Brian Abreu, Ryan Presley, and Josh Hader. And, you know, Presley's trying to find his way, uh, what his new role is. But uh, the bullpen's just giving up the world right now. And that's really been the problem because three of those four games against, all of those games against uh, New York were all comeback wins against the bullpen. Bomber, should they have done anything differently strategically? Like some fans were saying, don't pitch to Soto mm -hmm. late. Um, you know, if, if you're just looking at the specific three, the three previous games and seeing what Juan Soto was doing and realizing that that dude puts together some of the most unbelievable at bats, uh, in the big leagues. And then you have the matchup and the three, two count. Um, I don't know if you guys watched every pitch of that at bat, but there was a, I believe it was the two, two fastball in at 97 from Hader. We missed just off the inside corner, another hell of a take by uh, Juan Soto. I think that was the pitch of the at bat. He did everything to try and set up that heater in to try and lock him up, blow him up, get soft contact. And immediately when Soto, you can see him back out, kind of shake his head like going, yep, he's not going to hit that inside corner. And he shifted everything to that outside corner. And he won that at bat because he expanded off the outside corner to go get that pitch. But uh, when you consider how good Soto was, how bad Aaron Judge is uh, historically against the Astros, you could argue the fact, but I still think if you're just playing, you know, old school baseball and going by the book, you, you face Juan Soto in that situation. He did chase a pitch off the plate, but he's that good to get a hit on it. Are the guys at the end of that bullpen, Hader excluded because Hader just came in, now that they're on an island in, in the sense that they don't have Stanek, Maton, Maris anymore to – kind of ease them into the game. I'm not saying, are they going to get exposed in a certain way? Or do you still feel comfortable as an Astros fan with those three innings that those guys are going to give you? Uh, personally, I feel good with those innings. I know Brian Abreu's got wipeout stuff. We know Presley's got wipeout stuff. Hater's on another level. But at the same time, you guys know as well as I do, you can't go. If you have if you have a lead in a game and it's you know th less, three runs or less, can you – how often can you go a Brayu Presley hater to finish off games? It just it doesn't seem like that's going to be sustainable. You know, Joe Espada is going to have to do a good job of creating matchups. We saw Presley come in, in the seventh inning to face the middle part of the Yankees order uh, when Brian Abreu was still uh, on the suspension uh, that he had from last year. 
So I think it's going to really kind of be on Joe to be, how do you massage those guys into matchups that are going to really benefit the ball club? Because you're not going to go a Bray Presley hater on a nightly basis. You're just going to end up blowing those guys out. And you got to do something to be able to protect those guys. And that's where the Stanex, the Matons, and the Nerises came in because they were able to pick up setup innings. They were able to pick up closing innings if they had to, to pick up the closer. And that's what you're really missing right there. I think that it's going to be tough for Joe Espada to kind of create uh, pockets for Mashinsky, for Taylor uh, Scott. You know, Seth Martinez is nice and can eat some innings, but he's not one of those wipeout, locked type guys to get you out of jams. And the other guy's Brandon Belak, Belak, who basically, you know, he's a, he's a solid big league pitcher, maybe that four or five spot in your rotation. But is he that guy that's going to give you two innings in the middle, like an Ian Hamilton or a, you know a, a Jonathan Lewisaga? I don't think he's one of those types of guys. So. It's going to be tough to massage that middle part of the lineup so you don't abuse those big three at the back end. Butter, what, what, what's what's Joe Espada feeling right now? Because you're talking about him like he's got to find this and he's got to find that. He's never done this before. I mean, he's been a bench coach. He's been a third base coach. Mm-hmm. He's been he's been around it, right? But he's never been the guy in that chair that has to answer the questions and make these ultimate decisions. So what's his what's his life like right now? Um, I'm sure it's. I'm probably it's, it's probably a little uh, chaotic to to be honest with you. Those rides home at night are probably a little uh, solitary when you're trying to think and remanage the game in your head. Much like we would, uh, you know, re- go through every at bat and go through every pitch and go, man, I should have swung at that. But um, Joe Joe's very good at at getting the numbers, kind of uh, filtering through all that stuff, and he has an idea of who he is and who he wants to be. And I think we really saw that in that Yankees series. He pinch hit late for Jank Myers twice. I think that's going to be his MO, having two lefties on the bench in John Singleton and Victor Caratini. Uh, he's going to move Dubon into that rotate into that uh, center field spot to get him some at-bats. But I really do think that he's, he, he's working with the pitching coach, Josh Miller, to try and figure out pockets for that pitching staff. Another thing that I found was really interesting is um, Fromber. You know, the first game of the season was struggling in that fourth inning with one out, and he actually went out and got Fromber instead of letting his veteran work through that inning to get possibly get that W. So I thought that was kind of a big move. But you're right in the sense that this is the first time in his career where the responsi- responsibility is completely laid on his shoulders. He's always been that right-hand man, that advisory type guy where you can say, hey, if you thought about this, what about that? This might work. And now you have to you you got to make the moves and you got to answer the questions after the post game. This is another overreaction. How much of the Astros? I just asked it last week. How much of the Astros is going to miss Martin Maldonado? Not saying that Yiner Diaz isn't <laughs> carrying the team offensively. How much are they mm-hmm. going to miss him? Because just of what you just said, Framber had to come out of the game because you know maybe Maldonado doesn't go out there and you know Mike Maddox and like massage his shoulder out there how much are they going to miss him no I, I love you know having two catchers on here and having that aspect is beautiful and and you know that's the first thing that i thought of to be brutally honest after that game was man you know five or five six walks in that game at what point would have maldonado gone out there because before martin maldonado it was carlos correa who had to come running in in a playoff game and basically air out from Valdez and say, Hey man, you've got the stuff bear down, focus and get us out of this inning. And he went out there and did it much like Martin Maldonado, obvious deficiencies offensively, but what he was able to do as far as personality, the psychology of the game, calm from down, they really had a good relationship. And this is only one start for uh, Fromber and Yiner. And I truly hope that this kind of develops a little bit of a relationship because Yiner being kind of the younger guy having to adapt to the veteran pitcher, I hope there is a little bit of better communication in, this, in the starts coming up. But, I mean, that's the, that's the overreaction is to say, Martin wouldn't have let him get that far. Martin would have, you know, wrangled him in and had him focus on that strike zone, and he would have called a better game to get better pitches for strikes. But, you know, it, it was a tough outing to begin with, but six walks, I mean, that that's tough to come back from. How do you think the final line looks like for – Carlos Rodon, if he's healthy this season. Uh, for Rod- Rodon should be pretty good. I-, I like his stuff. I mean, I love the aggressive attitude too, but uh, you know, I think what, if you, the sooner you get Garrett Cole back in that rotation for the New York Yankees, I think it makes Carlos Rodon that much better. I'm, I, you know, it's not a knock on Carlos Rodon, but I think that having that, that superstar ace in front of him and kind of deflecting some of that attention 
maybe helps out Carlos a little bit. But I love the fact that you've got absolute jet fuel in Garrett Cole when he's healthy from the right side. And then you force managers on the opposing side to kind of change their lineup a little bit when you bring in a guy like Carlos Rodon, who's coming from that left side with velocity. Um, it really creates a little bit of a lineup issue, I think, for you know, for managers who like to play matchups from game to game. All right, last one. I heard Juan Soto called Jordan Alvarez the best lefty hitter in the sport. <laughs> Do you agree? Um, at this given moment, probably not. But overall, watching Jordan over the last you know th- th- three four years, I would argue that Jordan is one of the best hitters. He 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 missed a cup, so his misses go about four hundred feet. And unfortunately, at Minute Maid Park, if you hit him to center field, they're just it's a dead zone out there. But uh, I've got absolute faith in Jordan Alvarez, and I think greatness recognizes greatness because Soto, I think Soto understands his approach so well, and he might see a little bit of that in Jordan Alvarez because Jordan is is an Adonis. He is six foot five, two hundred and forty pounds of just chiseled rock hard human, and he steps in the box. He has a presence, but if you watch his his approach and his swing, the head is so still. He is so strong and believes in those hands so much where he'll let the ball travel maybe a little too deep sometimes and fight it off and go for the base hit as opposed to unleashing all hell when he can get the barrel to it and just hit these mega bombs. But he takes his walks when he's able to, and as good as that swing is and as often as he's in the zone, uh, you know, swinging at strikes, I think that, you know, it's just a matter of time before he gets going. And he's another one of those guys that when they do get hot, it becomes two, three hits a night with maybe a bomb going about 450 feet. But uh, that, that's pretty impressive. I mean, I know Juan Soto, you know, he's probably saying that because if I talk about him, more people will talk about me kind of thing, <laughs> which I totally get. But uh, those are two damn good hitters. Plummer, last one, last two things for me. One, that mic you have in front of you, is that what your hair used to look like when you had the tips frosted? Now there's this, this gray, this that's your new look? Yeah, no, I, yeah. I, I went to a custom mic company and I said, hey, I sent them a picture of my tips and I said, hey, I want a microphone to, to reinvigorate past Jeff Hare. And it worked perfectly. Because <laughs> you used to even have it like on the side sticking out. I mean, oh, you're dude. tight, right? It used to be like all the way. Bro, I look back at pictures of us in 2005 going down, you know, LaSalle and, on the bus and singing, you know, Don't Stop Believing with Steve Perry. And I'm going, dear God, I had the biggest hair helmet I think I've ever had in my life that, <laughs> during 05. <laughs> and I think as soon as I saw that picture, I immediately took the clippers and went right down the sides and got rid of the rest of it, man. I was carrying around a heavy load on top. No kidding. All right. And then before I let you go, we had Max Muncie on. So I wore this shirt just for you guys. I don't know if you can see it. Hold on, let me stand okay. up a little bit higher. Can you read it? No, are you kidding me? I need to put on my bifocals to read that we'll, thing. We'll, we'll read it for you. you. Don't mess with yeah, Texas, it. but definitely don't fuck with Florida. <laughs> nice, that a boy. Yeah, I've been indoctrinated into the Texan way. It's definitely don't mess with Texas, but we're not messing with alligators and all that kind of stuff and the swamp animals <laughs> you got down in Florida, dude. Hell Smart. No. You've learned well. You've learned well. I taught you well. <laughs> yep. Oh, I know. Any- any ex-teammates that come on of AJ's, I have to ask, because AJ has this big bad boy persona. I sit here and say, hey, you know, you don't like AJ when you play against him, and you just don't like him a little less when you play against, <laughs> when you play with him. So was AJ a good teammate or not a good teammate? I tell you what, th- there is that is the single question I get most often. <laughs> you know, 2005 had Paul Konerko, Jermaine Dye, you know, Freddie Garcia, Mark Burley, and all the only question I get was, how did you stay in the clubhouse with AJ Pierzynski the entire time? And it was one of the, and I'm, and then they get even more shocked when I'm like, I actually text the guy. We talk to each other. We we can actually sit down and have a meal and hang out together and we would be just fine. But you're right in the sense that when you played against him, dear God, you want it. You've wanted (laughs) to bury him every chance you got. Um, you know, I, I don't think I played too many games with AJ behind the plate, but I, the reputation was there. I get to Chicago and I think we were playing the Blue Jays and AJ punched out on th- three changeups and comes back to the dugout calling. I don't know who the pitcher was calling him names, you know, obviously, you know, throw me a fastball. And I'm like, <laughs> and I looked at him and I go, Hey dude, I go, did you swing at the fastball? He goes, no. And I go, what'd you get? He goes, three straight F- change-ups. I'm like, why'd you swing? And he's like, 
I don't know. <laughs> just like that posture <laughs> back there. I love and, it. And from, from that moment on, uh, we were like the best of boys. And we, would, uh, we were high-fiving. We were cracking jokes. I mean, it was, it was the best of times. And, and uh, I don't know why. <laughs> and I don't know why, okay? <laughs> I don't know. It, but it, the, the passion <laughs> of it is what kind of gravitated to it because – you know, I talked to, I asked Age, I'm like, you know, is this who you are? He's like, no, I do it because this is how I play the game. And part of me actually appreciated that because I didn't have that kind of mentality or ability to play that kind of mind game because I was struggling so much trying to handle my own game. Yeah, I, I, well, listen, I appreciate a Blummer, but I'll tell you this. I tell people all the time and they laugh at me. I had to play angry. Like the angrier yeah. I got, the better, like the ang- like the, the more mad I could hate the other team, like the, the, the fans booing me, I'm like, you know, fuck this. I was better. Like I was, mm-hmm. that's why I always had a hard time. And this, I, this is not a, bra- it's going to sound like it, but I don't mean this, but like, humble bra- I was better. No, but I was better against the better pitchers. Right. Yeah. Than I was against like the fifth starter on a sun because I, I wasn't, I, listen, it sounds bad, but I, not that I wasn't into it, but like when you get like Pedro and you got Maddox and you got these, mm-hmm. you were like, it was laser time. Like it was like, all right, I'm not going to get embarrassed by this guy that's going to the mm-hmm. hall of fame. Whereas, you know, you're like, ah, I can sneak in a hit against the five fifth starter sometimes, and you go over four. And you're like, then it was like, God, what am I doing? Like, what is wrong? You know, mm-hmm. So that was just the way I had to do. It. And I appreciate you telling that story because Kratz still thinks that I'm like that. No, but that that kind of explains some of the separation once you get to the big league. If you don't, I didn't play every day, and but I always had the mentality that I should have. And the second I lacked that idea that I should shouldn't be playing every day, that that guy should be playing over me, or I shouldn't be facing that guy, that's when I knew I was done with the game, and that's when I checked out. Because every day, if I showed up like you were saying, you know, if I wasn't ready to lock it in and like say that I'm going to compete against this guy, then there was no point in me being in that box, and it would definitely not benefit my team if I was giving away the bats like that. Hey, you had one good swing. That's all I needed from you. Just one. That's you all we needed. Well, yeah. Sure. I mean, because the spread was getting cold. <laughs> <laughs> I still remember where I was for that swing. I was out in Arizona. I was in the fall league with your old, with your old asses playing. Jeez, you guys are so old. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I remember I was, I was drinking a beer in the clubhouse with Kenny Williams on the couch in Houston. I was at Fox sports, Fox sports, whatever the lounge that was called out in Arizona, out in uh, Peoria, oh, yeah. I think it was. Uh, Kenny awesome. Williams looked at me. I love those. Kenny Williams, Kenny Williams looked at me. We were on. We were having a beer in the clubhouse. We were up two zero, obviously, and they had started uh, Oswald that game. We came back from like four nothing and took the lead, and we're in like the thirteenth inning. What was it? Fourteenth inning when you hit the home run. Thirteenth. It was a, at the time. It was the longest yeah. World Series game. You probably history. forgot. And uh, probably forgot. <laughs> it, forgot. It, just, it, it escapes me. I have no idea. Yeah. <laughs> so, but I'm sitting there and we're and I'm literally having a beer with the GM at the time. We're in the little. If you've never been, there's like a little couch sections in the Houston Visiting Clubhouse, and it's like recliner. And I kind of have my feet up, and I'd been double switched out of the game earlier, and because Houston was in the National League at the time, and we we're National League rules, and I get switched out, and he looks at me and he goes, "If we," he's like, "Obviously, you go up 3-0, but he's like, "If we win this game, they're done." He's like, "Oswald was their best shot against us." And then literally two seconds later, Blum hits the home run. And we were like, holy shit. And then I ran out there and you know, I had to put the beer down and ran out. Don't spill it. <laughs> <laughs> well, great reminiscing and also good talking ball with you on that first series. It got a lot of attention. So great to have wait, you on. Wait, here. I do. Wait, Blumer, uh, I'm in yep. April 13th into Houston. I don't know if you guys take it off that day, though, because it's an FS1 game. No, we, Saturday, we only... Yeah, we'll be there. I'll be fr- I'll be fresh off my trip to Augusta. Oh, you're bad. Whoops. Speaking of Whoops. humble brags, What's tasting yourself, you're bad. Salty vet asking for the right days off, boy. Wow, ah. wow. Sorry, yeah, but I'll see you on the thirteenth. Yeah, we'll be we'll be doing a side by side on that. All right, perfect. I'll be in the little tiny booth, by the way. And I'll I was get, I can't say, wait, dude. For, I can't wait, I can't <laughs> wait for the knock bar. Yeah, to be able to be a battle at the nacho bar for sure. <laughs> <laughs> Please, somebody record it for us. Uh, Robert, we'll talk to you soon, and AJ, we'll see you soon. No, great seeing you guys. Appreciate it. You too. Thank you. Jeff Blum with us. Obviously, you can catch him on Astros broadcasts. They do a great job on that broadcast. They do. Him and Callis. Yeah. Callis. I'm so, very – what? Well, so when we traded for him, right, it was – we were – we went we we went wire to wire and won the division, right? Never, never trailed. And – 
everyone's like, what big moves are they going to make? They have like a, you know, at the time we like trade down, we had like a seven, eight game lead. And everyone's like, what, what, what's the big move they're going to make? So we made one move and it was to get him. <laughs> and the media went crazy. Really? They were like, that's it. What? And we were like, we're good. We're good. And then the guy who had the biggest hit, or not the biggest hit, but one of the biggest hits in the World Series was him. He got one at bat. He took one swing and he hit a home run. And that, that's why we traded for him. But he also, listen, during the season, he did a lot of things because he could play everywhere. He was a utility guy. Play third, play short, play second, play the outfield, switch hit. So he could give you a lefty at bat. He could give you a righty at bat. And he was great in the clubhouse. I mean, we loved him. He was like, he was, he came in in the middle and was like, he was just one of us. It was like Marco Scudero for the Giants. People were like, that's it. I mean, they might have done something else too. I don't remember at the time. But w- were the players pissed about it? Because, you know, no. sometimes players are like, where was our big gun? Where was this guy? We didn't I mean, need one, though. You we guys didn't, didn't have any holes and you didn't one. have any injuries either, did you? I mean, we, we did have three closers that year. Right. So what do you need? About. Fourth? <laughs> I mean, no, I know, but our bullpen was solid. Our, I mean, we had five unbelievable starters. And six, they weren't really, hurt. They were pitching. Six if you count Brandon McCarthy. Right. Right. And then, sure. I mean, we had every position was kind of locked up. Yeah. I mean, our position players were solid all year. So there was really nowhere to go get. That's why Kenny Wood was like, well, who am I going to go get? He's like, we got Canerico at first, Aguchi, Uribe, Creedy, Pasednik, Rowan, Die. And our DH was Carl Everett. Where are you gonna, who are you going to go get? You're going to piss someone off if you do something. Well, that's why were, he was like, who am I going to go get? Yeah. He's like, our bullpen guys were all dealing. We had Bobby Jenks in the back end, Cliff Polite, Neil Cotts, Dustin Hermanson, Damaso Marte. I mean, I was like, where are you going to go? Nope. It worked. He did it. All right, let's make some accurate picks here. So your bet MGM locks, but we're going to start with the free game of the day. So Red Sox A's is your free game of the day, streaming on the BetMGM app. Live streaming is available to all BetMGM customers who are logged in and have funded accounts. Let's spend a minute talking about this game. So we've got Joe Boyle going up against Tanner Houck. These are two teams that are not likely to be playoff worthy. Well, you're looking at me weird. Who was the first guy? Joe Boyle. He pitched for Oakland, right? Because yeah. Tanner Hawks Hawks on the uh, Reds. Okay. Uh, yeah, yeah. Is he Did ready or lefty? Uh, Boyle is. God. Do you know your A's? I don't. I'm sorry. I, I believe he's I a righty, not. but I don't want to say it wrong because then people will be all over me. He's a righty. Okay. Six seven two forty. Ooh, righty. big boy. He can pick up punch outs. I mean, he's he's got some stuff. I mean, I'm not. Uh, he should be one of their better pitchers. I would say. Okay. He's young, obviously. Yeah, like the, I I wouldn't. He should be one I mean, of their best top five starters. <laughs> yeah, okay. he should be a top Old five. Top five, top five. It, well, this isn't a game where Boston's at like minus 210 or something. You know, like later on, and I'll get to it, but the Dodgers are heavily favored against the Giants. I think it was in the minus 200s for money line. Like this game is minus 145 Boston. Or if you want to play the run line, it's plus 120. It's it's at Oakland. Everyone always has a hard time at Oakland. It doesn't matter yeah. if they're good, bad. It's like you go to Oakland and everyone like goes, oh. <laughs> and that's why they might lose 100 and not 115. Yeah. Listen, I mean, hopefully it's a good game. Uh, hopefully, you know, whoever you bet on wins. <laughs> Boston played pretty well this weekend against Boston Seattle. Played good against Seattle. Their yeah. pitching was better than expected for sure. Yes. It's not a bad Seattle team. It's just strikes out. when you look at Boston compared to, yes. And Seattle doesn't cool. still doesn't have offense. No. Right? They don't they have don't. enough offense. They still they don't, don't have enough offense. They do not have enough offense. Like, you can have the best pitching staff in the world, Kratz. If you don't score enough runs, it doesn't matter. you got to score manufacture some offense. Goal. they got to manufacture it. You can't have an MVP candidate in your lineup and not manufacture. You're not all MVPs. Manufacture runs. Figure it out. And they got rid of Caballero. Caballero was a guy that would put together at-bats. They punch out so many times. Pavetta just... Ticket, ticket, ticket. K props. Ticket, ticket, ticket. Like this Doyle guy, Boyle guy, he might, he might get, he might get an over. <laughs> he's at five and a half. Yeah, I would. But if he's out there long enough, the problem is early in the year, it's so hard to go K props because they're not out there long enough. Yeah, you're just you're there, there's not it just because you're just heard Blummer say like the starters go four to five innings, so they're not out there enough to to run up the K props. The Mariners will get it. Mar- are the Mariners the new Twins and Giants from last year? Mariners were them last year. They, they were, were those guys. They're trying not to be that this year. We'll spend some time on the M's. Let's get to our locks, okay? So for Friday, Kratz and me were texting. Nailed it. AJ Ramos new to the party. He went nice and simple with the Phillies to beat the Braves. Didn't happen. Uh, Dodgers cleared. 
what I needed on that Friday night. And Kratz, you got your case. Yeah, Pavetta made it easy for you. I think Kirby was at eight. Still, somewhat no sweat bet. There was there was no sweat. Kirby was had like seventy pitches. He had five punches, and then he struck out the side. It was like, ah, that's easy. Appreciate you. I mean, I went with Bobby Miller run line against the number six starter in game two of the season for the Cardinals, Zach Thompson. And then after the game, you know, his velo was down and they said he was working on mechanics. And I'm like, this was the wrong game to work on mechanics. You just said spring training. <laughs> I mean, I get it. Like you, you need to get yourself right. I'm just like, man, you're running into a freaking buzzsaw yeah. with that team. So here's money bags. That was a good series though. It was a good series. They almost split the series. I mean, Max series. Muncy saved them. Lance like, Lynn, how about him? He was, he was three hits to lead off, and then he was fired up. Boy, he was doing all kinds of crotch grabs. They need Lance Lynn, the Cardinals. That's a nice edge for them. Um, there's your money bags. And then uh, Jonathan Papelbon's going to be participating with us all year long. So he went 1-0, and and he's going to be aggressive. He tweeted the other day, <laughs> me talking about MGM after opening day, just go ahead and give me the nickname already, Papnosticator. <laughs> all right, Pap, you're up, dude. What do you got today? What's up, Foul Territory fans? John Pavlovon coming back at you with Pat's pick to click. Yeah, that's right. We started off 500 winner right out the gate last week, opening day. So we playing with house money. How's that feel? So with that being said, man, I had to give me a workout in today, clear my mind, make sure I got the right pick today. I, I did that. I got my workout in. I got y'all a two-game parlay today. And man, it's going to be amazing because we're going to win some money. If you're ready for it, here we go. Baltimore. Kansas City, Baltimore at home. We're going to take that over. Then we're going to build that parlay with the Reds and the Phillies. We're going to take the Phillies over as well as Citizens Bank. Harp's going to probably hit a home run today, get the team going. So um, those odds, if you want to know, are going to be at plus 273. And I'm going to lay 275, which is going to end up winning me $1,028. So, folks, let's keep it rolling, baby. Yeah, I love this. Like I, I do the based off of hundreds and Paps based off way whatever. more. Paps based off whatever <laughs> just number he pulls out of a hat. Yeah. He All was. right. So good luck, Pap. Uh, he's, he's, a, he's a peach. He is. He is. What do you have, Kratz? I'm going Mackenzie Gore. The under five and a half Ks. He's facing the Pirates. He hasn't hit five and a half Ks yet this season, so I'm pretty sure he's not going to hit five and a half Pirates. They don't strike out a ton, so I feel like I feel like we got a we got an opportunity as Gore gets his pitch count up here to get a little under. I see him getting about four punchies today. Okay, nice. Yeah, it's amazing. That's plus one ten. It's amazing he hasn't gotten to five and a half uh, Ks yet this year. Yeah, <laughs> I was I wondering if you were listening. Oh, no, we're on it. We're on it. Oh, trust me, I was listening. All right, you're up. Hold on. First of all, I was I was looking. Rowdy's not playing, so I was just looking to see because he's been hot, you know, since we had that Pilates session together in uh, Bradenton last week. On the broken tired. Pilates machine. On the broken yeah, that he machine. broke. That he broke. We won't talk about it though because he said he was over the weight limit. I mean, wait, did I say that out loud? <laughs> um, <laughs> all right, so I, I'm kind of following Pat, but I'm going away crazy. I'm going back. I'm midseason for him here, so I'm taking the over in the Cincinnati Philly game just because they're playing in. Citizen Small Bank Park, and you know everything is goes out of there. And then uh, I'm taking Sanchez and Abbott both to give up four plus hits because both these teams can swing it. And Abbott has a lot of walks, so I'm going to throw in one walk, and that gets me to plus two sixty. Wow! Okay. So I'm going to bet two hundred, and the two hundred win me five twenty. Okay. Dang. Right. You get AJ yeah. around Pap, and he starts getting the the wallet gets a little loose. I like it. Right. Yeah. You know, Pap said we're going to win us some Monday. <laughs> My name. All right, keep it simple. I'm banging that Astros run line right now until they start challenging me with like a minus 150 on it. It's minus 105. They're going up against the Giants. A strong start on offense for San Francisco. Dodgers. 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 You, said you said Astros? I'm like, the Astros are playing the Giants? I said Astros, man. I got to get yeah, more you, sleep. You got Blummer on your mind. Woo. Uh, Keaton Wynn. Last season, his last start of the year was against the Dodgers. Gave up six runs. It's a tougher offense this time around. I think the Dodgers are going to have a lot of lopsided games. So when they win, I think they're going to win big. So I'll take their run line early on. I like run lines early and late in the season, not in the middle. So 
I'll ride that for now, see what happens. And your first bet offer, if you use the code FOUL, F-O-U-L, is $1,500 back in bonus bets, up to $1,500 back in bonus bets. Uh, if you download the BetMGM Sportsbook app on iOS or Android and visit BetMGM.com, sign up and deposit at least 10 bucks into the account, place your first wager, and receive up to $1,500 back in those bonus bets if the bet loses. And if that happens, the bonus bets will be available once your initial wager is settled. Gambling problem or concern? Call 1-800-GAMBLER. All right, here's a bet for you. Yeah. When's Otani hit his first homer? Tonight. What about you? I'm, I'm asked, I asked you. I didn't say when. I think tonight. I think tonight he goes deep for the first time? That's actually part of my mix here is the Dodgers almost split the series with the Cardinals. Muncy saves the day. Offense looks pretty good. Otani hasn't done much yet. I mean, he's hitting the ball hard. It's only a matter of time. He almost hit a homer once or twice in yeah, Korea. I mean, I almost hit a homer too, but it didn't go out. <laughs> Ground rule doubles aren't homers. I mean. I'm, I'm anticipating tonight. If you would have had Miggy Rojas as more homers than Shohei Otani, would, you would have probably won a lot of money. You would have. Yeah. Miggy Rowe for a, for a home run prop, you're probably getting good money there. Good value. Him, Did, so, want to do hot corner? No. <laughs> Too no. late. <laughs> the fire started. <laughs> okay, take it back. I have no idea how to put it out. Really? You don't want to talk about ball three mm. to Nick Castellanos mm. on Saturday that led to more runs for the Phillies and Max Fried didn't get out of the first inning? Max Fried threw 43 pitches, didn't he? Sounds 43 right. pitches. The reason – okay, so we I think we talked about this, didn't we? The yeah. guys aren't supposed to have – like Yamamoto – it was Yamamoto. Like, you don't mm -hmm. let him throw. That's why he was out of the game because you can't let a – it's just bad for you. You can't throw 50 pitches in an inning. Like, that's just not – it's awful. So, that's why the Braves are like, yeah, 43. And then this, this this pitch to Castellanos is right down the middle. Like, we had some bad umpiring this weekend. And I wasn't here on Friday, but after the Thursday night game, the the, the Rangers-Cubs, and I'm not going to call the umpire out by name, but he was awful. A lot of missed ball strikes. And then how on earth in today's world can we not review the foul tip call? Like, how can we not review that? I understand, like, there's certain things that aren't reviewable, but, like, that was clear as day. Like, there should be there should be like the NFL, right, where a guy comes in the umpire's ear and goes, hey, by the way, that was foul. Just call it foul. Let the play play out. And then the guy goes, hey, uh, Mr. Umpire guy, uh, that was foul. We just send him back. Why, why, why can't we do that? One day that's going to be a thing, and people are going to look back, you know, they're going to talk to, like, kids or grandkids or whatever and be like, there was a time where – that call was just wrong, and we all lived with it. Be like, Grandpa, what? Yeah, that's what we did. I know. It was stupid. I got no explanation for it. Oh, you didn't have the technology for it? No, we did. We had high-definition cameras catching every angle of everything. Well, then why didn't you make that call? I don't know. Just stupidity. We were just stupid back also, then. Also, they have the thing, and they haven't used it in forever, but Fox used to have a thing where it would, like, show the friction. So you could actually see... Like if a ball hit a guy, you could see it like on his jersey. They used it in the 2011 World Series. The only only time they ever used it, they tried it. They had a camera that was like a heat camera, and you could see like the the when it, like a guy if he hit the base or not, and it would show like his spikes on the base when they went over the base. And like a guy got hit, you would see the like where the heat of the friction. I mean, we can't we can't throw one of those and show that the ball was fouled off. And here's my thing: if it's that obvious, then you make the call. If it's inconclusive, then you say I can't make yeah. a call. But that was, was so obvious. So obvious. Yes. So that that pitch, though, I mean, was a big deal in the game for Max Fried. There were some people on social media like, "What's wrong with Max Fried? Is he hurt?" I'm like, "No, he's not. He's not going 50 pitches in the first. <laughs> he got worked. There it is. Oof." Oh, no, in all honesty, gosh. that box isn't always correct, but that one nope. was pretty correct. I think the box helped him out. I think I, I think it should have been even more in the middle of the box. I mean, it's belt high fastball. What? Watch Castellanos. Let Castellanos tell you if it was a strike. He's walking back. Oh, he's going back to the dugout. <laughs> yeah, he's, he's walking like, back. Two two pitch. What pitch? Of the, what pitch of the inning was that? Was that pitch like thirty something? It would have got him. It would no. It was less than that, but it would have got him out of the inning and. That's what Save, I mean. What, four runs and 20, 20 pitches, probably? See ya. You know whose contract year it is? Max Umpires? Free. Max Reed. No. Well, umpire, but <laughs> that sucks. That, you know? Get judged don't off think, that don't shit. Don't think Scott Boris isn't watching that. Yeah. Get judged off that. All right, ready for slap hands?
this is now the foul territory network. So if you're hanging around and sticking here for a little Dodgers territory, this is your spot. Okay. Dodgers territory with Alana Rizzo and Clint Pasias is coming up next. Did they get that super special guest that I was hearing about? What I heard. Anyone know? I bet you I'm going to get an answer. Yeah. I'll say it. I mean, it's in five minutes. Will Smith. Oh. Will Smith on Dodgers territory. He'll come on here. He'll go on there. Yeah. Wow. But it's part of the FT fam. So True, but I would like to talk to Will Smith about getting jiggy with it. Should I go in the chat during DT and say, Will? Yeah, what about us? Why don't you like us? <laughs> hey, it's Have Scott Brown here. I don't know. I don't know if we've asked for him in fairness. So He's not someone that's given us the Heisman. There's a few that have. They we go have. unnamed for now. There are a few that have. But anyway. There are a few that have no-showed us too. That, that is true. Not many, but a few. Kratzats, what do you have? Because we got to get I mean, kicked out in three minutes. Coming off your coming oh. off your four and oh, how can you not have a I packed these hats before this weekend, okay? Before I left. So it's just I mean, they might go 162 and 0. They might. I'll take the under. I'll, I'll take the under as well. <laughs> okay, fair. I've been told we have something special from the Cubs. I have no idea. This is something April new. Fool's joke? Oh, is that what it is? I don't know. Let's see. That's their that's their pyrotechnics. Uh, this thing's hit hard. Come on. Wow. Seriously, he's like no. Oh, that's their opening day py- pyrotechnics. And only two of them today. are working, right? Because they had four, the- and only two are going off. Oh. I'm like, no comment. Why? No comment. I want to comment. No comment. Because he can't, Chicago, he can't comment on his new favorite team, the Cubs. That's why he's trying no to. Comment. What happened? Yeah, no comment. Do you think the wind was blowing? So it was blowing out, and so they couldn't turn the other two on? Yeah. By the way, speak, speaking of, and I don't know, no comment, but I'm going to say this. So one of the most famous <laughs> White Sox fans is a guy. His name is George Jacobs. He's the M&M jacket guy. I'm sure you guys have seen him at I've seen a him. million White Sox games. The Cubs game is a Cubs home opener, and he is a traitor. I'm going to have to text him after the game because he is sitting right behind Come on. home plate for the Cubs-Rockies game. And I'm going to text him and be like, dude, you are a traitor. He's there for the pyro. <laughs> <He's> there- <laughs> so he-, he just goes, yo, I'm not here for the game. I hate the Cubs. I'm here for the pyrotechnics. I heard it was going to be sick. <laughs> hey, uh, maybe he wants to watch some good baseball now. Yeah, you know. Well, the Sly- Rockies are in town, so I don't know what, if that's what. Counts. Okay, okay. He he forgot. He didn't he didn't look at the schedule. Mm. And Emma Naga's pitching, so. So, slap hands runs on the pod that we post, you know, every day soon after the show, right? Because then some parts of interviews get posted as their own pods. This is for the people, but I just want to make sure that if someone's listening to the end of the pod today, they understand the pyrotechnics that. Went off the spark, the sparklers, Wrigley. the sparklers there was that two they lit. sparklers. And yeah. whoever it was Christopher Morell ran out first. The one, like one of them, barely went up. Like it was only like quarter, quarter. The other one was high, and the other, and then the other two didn't work. Yeah, it was. It was I just text George Jacobs trader. That's all I text him. Did you see like the Mets? Didn't they have like all the fire and a whole thing, right, for their intros? Some teams care about that. I know, but if you're gonna do that, you got to do it. And if if not, I don't think you have to. I don't think someone's sitting there going, I better see fire when Christopher Morell comes out of that dugout or I am leaving. Maybe, maybe they're maybe they're pyrotechnics. They were like, hey, get us some pyrotechnics like our off season. And they were like, Cubs off season right here. Watch, look. The one on the right doesn't even barely go off. Somewhat shooting blanks on the right. Looks like a candle. Pirates oh, off, Cubs Jeez. off season. Maybe it's, maybe it's how much you make is how big the pyro is because Morell didn't work and then Swanson it went all the way. Right. Your salary's higher, money. you get more fire. Yeah, mm-hmm. that rhymed. Uh, Justin Steele though is likely not back until May. Yeah, he grabbed that hammy hard. That sucks. Oh, you weren't with us Friday. We talked about it. That's that's a bad injury for them. Yeah. I mean, he lo- and he looked like Justin Steele. Like sometimes people are like, "Oh, I don't know if it's like smoking mirrors. He's got two pitches. Oh, he's got variations of those pitches, so you could make the case he's got five or six. But he throws pretty damn really good. Well. He looked good. 
Yep. That's a really good offense on opening day. And he looked good. It's a big loss for them. All right, we have a delicious sandwich from Queens. Hey, they know how to do pyrotechnics for Mets opening day. They also know how to feed their fans with a $40.55 surf and turf sandwich from Pat LaFridis. I mean, come on. Surf and turf sounds pretty good. Yeah. But $40. 40 huh? bones? But here's the uh, I'll go when I when I when I go there for Fox, I'll pay so I can do it. Um, <laughs> but not, my question is, why they got to put the calories on everything? I don't want to know how many calories. That's a, I don't need. To, I don't need to know it's fourteen hundred calories. I don't. I just don't. I, I don't even know what that means. I just want to enjoy it, and then like, gosh, I feel myself. Calories are weird to me. I don't. I don't yeah. understand. I don't understand it. It's got mayo in, so I know it's not good for you. I also think surf and turf. Is always expensive. Yeah. So relative to the ballpark, it actually didn't Filet surprise and me. lobster? No, fine. Right? I mean, you go to Shake Shack, it's like $20, so what's the difference? And at a ballpark, everything's pretty much double at any ballpark. Yeah. So, good job, Matt. But I have to, one more thing. I was in San Diego, and they got rid of Din Tai Fung at the ballpark. I was not, I wasn't very happy about that. Did you get an explanation? Well, I had it for lunch, and I had it, for, I had it delivered for lunch, and I was going to double up at the ballpark, and then they were like, well, they don't have it here anymore, and I was like, what? What? They, they were like, we had to get rid of Soto, Snell, <laughs> and <laughs> yeah, but Din Tai Fung. I don't, know, I don't know if you've ever been to Din Tai Fung, but it's awesome. Uh -huh. Oh, that's a tough loss. It, it was. Padres. I was, I, was, I was not happy. I was like, wait a minute. We I couldn't have that back. and Dylan Cease. We had to choose. <laughs> um, Bob Nightingale took a photo that went kind of viral of Dodger Stadium. I believe it was day two. Was that Saturday, I think? I sent it, I should know. And he said, attendance 47,524, dispelling any idea they will sell out every game this season. They still hope to draw a franchise record 4 million fans this year. There's actually a great reply from a fan who showed the capacity of the stadium. So 47K takes down the capacity of 28 out of 32 stadiums. The Coliseum is the largest at 56,782. Dodger Stadium second at about 56,000. It's a big ass ballpark. They're trying to build ballparks like half the size now. Oakland's going to have what, 28,000 or 30,000? In Vegas, like that? it's like yeah. half the size. So they are filling up a ballpark for, what's the number? 81 games with 45K plus. They're going to set an attendance record. AJ right. saw a rain delay in San Diego. Nope. No, they had one in LA. You saw the tarp. I did see the tarp. It didn't hit BP. That's rare. Oh, yeah. Every time I go to San Diego, it rains. Book it. I was there two weeks ago. Rained. There this time, rained. Playoffs 2022, rain delay. Every time I've been to San Diego, it's rained. Like, in my I life. I like big stadiums. I think they should make big stadiums, but I understand why they make quaint little stadiums. But I like big stadiums, and it's more money for playoff tickets, too, for the players. Maybe we lost our guys. I don't know anything that's going on because we're supposed to be at the end of our show here, and it's – it's about that time. So if we're talking about big stadiums, that's what we have. Maybe hey, my guys sorry. are back. We're back. We're back. What did we miss? Um, Dodgers territory coming <laughs> up soon, though. Uh, will Smith will join the show. We had Max Muncy at the top of the show. We talk about other teams in the middle, too. But um, we'll have Alana Rizzo and Clint Pasillas coming up in just a sec. But, um, yeah, I think the Dodgers are going to make a lot of money this year. I, I, I think – I'm They're advertising themselves. Oh, yeah. I'm not too concerned about, you know, the the ultimate nosebleed seats. And the, uh, Four million? And Four million is going to be tough. They're going to have to average over 50 a game. What's the breakdown? I mean, 81 games. That, that's, Hold on. They're going to have to average 49. Well, you gotta average, you gotta, if you go 80 games times 50, that's 4 million. That's 4 million. So you're going to have to average at least 49. Uh, 49,382 per game. 
That's tough. That's a lot. That's a lot. That's a lot of fans. One swag check here. Bryce Harper, shin guard. Boss. What is it? It's a cup. <laughs> With the fanatic in the cup? I don't know. Yeah. I, is that what it is? I don't, I don't know what it's it Philly is. Philly fanatic drip. It's Philly fanatic drip. He's got a lot of drip. That's a lot of. And a lot of Philly fanatic. A lot of Philly drip, drip too. Yeah. The I like cleats, it. The furry cleats that he's got. But like, what is that? That's a Philly fanatic in there? Is he? Maybe it's. Maybe it's a promotion. They're doing a Philly Fanatic Cup, and he just was breaking the news on his leg. <laughs> I mean, it's fun. If you're going to have a shin guard, you might as well have it look like that, right? I wonder if the league wants to find him. Remember when the league used to come out with, like, oh, you can't have this much color that's outside. Oh, I used to get it all the time. I used to get it all the time. 51 what? had to be 51% black, my shoes. I used to get so mad. Did you get fined? They would, they, yes. They, you you Someone got fined? I know they always. They always. Me and Jermaine, threatened. Jermaine, Di, and I had the same shoes one year. They were called oh super God. bads, and they were football shoes. And they made just for him and I. They made them uh, baseball cleats for us. And there were there's a pair of them over there, but they're badass. And they said they weren't. They were like fifty point seven percent black. Or, I don't know. It was it was some. Cr- it was like what? Like who's measuring this? Now you can wear whatever color cleats. What they did right, like yeah, they who cares it. what color your cleats are? Oh, totally. This is what I'm talking about. Now you can say yes. There was a time where I would get fined for 51 percent of my cleats being a color that they weren't happy with. We live in better times, I think. I don't know. We live in better times for FT because the network continues with. Dodgers territory next. Alana and Clint are going to talk to Will Smith, who is the newest rich Dodger coming off a big weekend for the team. So Alana and Clint have fun. We'll see everyone else on Tuesday.